Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Sunday, February 17th, 2013. This is episode 954. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Ring Central. I love my cloud based phone system from Ring Central. Zero startup costs and just $20 per month per user. Try Ring Central now with a 30 day risk free trial. And when you buy one desk phone, you'll get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT. And buy Landtronics, maker of the X Print server. Print from your iPad, iPhone, or any iOS device to virtually any printer. For more information, visit xprintserver.com slash twit. And don't forget to enter the code TWIT to receive free shipping on your order. <laughs> well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, uh, the tech guy. And uh, we are about to talk about all sorts of technology topics. That's what we do on this show each and every weekend right here at this time. 88, let me give you a, a couple of, take care of a couple of business and we'll talk. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number, 888-827-5536. That's toll free anywhere in the U.S. But if you're outside the U.S., and I know we have many, many listeners over the uh, Internet, get calls from all around the world. Uh, you can also uh, use a Skype or VoIP or some, you know, some kind of VoIP solution to call that number. And because it's a toll free number in the U.S., shouldn't cost you anything to call us. We had a caller from Belgium who was using, well, I can't remember the name of the uh, VoIP he was using. It was another, another choice. And then um, the website, which this is probably the most important. If you, have to, if you need to remember but one thing, remember techguylabs.com. I'm the tech guy. That's my lab. Techguylabs.com. That's where we uh, put all the uh, notes from the show as we go. In fact, James DeRuvo's writing as we go. And putting, uh, you know, writing down things as we talk about them. So you can always never have to remember anything I talk about. We also have the question of the week. We have the tip of the week. We have the hero of the month, Russell, our IT guy. We love him. He's, he's so great. And every show, uh, after the show, you can see all the episodes. And after the show, we even put up video uh, and audio from the show. So if you want to look at a particular question, you can actually jump right to that question and my answer. And then the best part, and I encourage you to do this if you're listening to a question and an answer, is, and if you have something to add, is to do it in the comments. Please, we'd love it if you would, because then uh, we have, you know, this, uh, this rich resource of questions and answers, not just mine, but the community. And I really believe in that. And this is free. There's no charge. We don't charge for anything we do here. I know many other radio shows will charge you for the podcasts of their show or of the website or full access or whatever. No, no, it's it's all free, thanks to our great advertisers, who uh, who then, you know, sponsor the show and so forth. So, techguylabs.com. Uh, I like at the beginning of every show to talk a little bit about what's going on in the news, and there's so much to talk about. Yesterday we talked about the the Microsoft Surface and how it sold out within minutes <laughs> and they're now coming back into the market. We also talked about better alternatives perhaps if you really want Windows 8 and we keep getting calls from people who say I got Windows 8 and I got Windows 8 hate and uh, so that's uh, kind of an ongoing discussion is wither Windows and is 8 really great and should you go that direction and so forth. Um, so uh, we could talk a little bit about that. I kind of want to talk about uh, uh, when to buy a computer. I know that's kind of of interest to people. This is a nice thing, and one of the reasons I think tablets and, and smartphones now are so popular and really growing faster than desktops is because you don't have to think about that. You just buy it when it comes out, right? And, yeah, there's always going to be a new iPad, but you get the current one. That's fine. It's good enough. I guess there's a little bit of a question. And, and, and Apple met, muddied the waters on that because it was every year they'd come out with a new iPad in the spring, and then they came out with an extra one last September, and now we're wondering, well, is there going to be one in the spring that right away, or will it be December? And we don't know. Uh, we don't know. I think the current iPad is great. I like the iPad mini. I guess there'd be some questions if you were thinking about getting an iPad mini. Should I wait for a 
faster and or retina display iPad mini? And that's a reasonable question. But I like the iPad mini so much, I say, yeah, just go ahead and get it. When you're talking about smartphones, yeah, the new Galaxy S4 uh, is rumored for, uh, well, announced next month and available probably April or May and looks really great. So if you can hold off a few months, I'm, you might want to if you're an Android lover. I don't know about the new iPhone. I don't know when that's going to come out. <laughs> you could be, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing in the fall. I really am. But Apple uh, kind of uh, uh, got people thinking a little bit when they just this week dropped the prices on, uh, on some of their MacBooks, their 13-inch MacBook Pro Retina. They dropped 200 bucks. Apple very rarely, I can't, you know, it's rare that Apple will take an existing product and drop the price. They also upgraded some of their other laptops with uh, faster processors. And I think a lot of people, and I hope, I think that's what Apple hopes, are going, oh, yeah, great. Mm. But should you buy, this is the question, should you buy now or wait? And there's a great article that I just read in GigaOM, TikTok. Why Timing Your Mac Hardware Upgrades Makes Good Sense. It's by a guy named Jeffrey Getz, and he makes some excellent points. I believe, and Jeffrey, I think, agrees, it is not the time to buy a new laptop now. Even a Windows 8 laptop, it's probably not the time to buy. Intel has a uh, TikTok cycle of chip releases, and they, both Macs and Windows PCs are all, you know, all the desktops are based on Intel. Intel's in a fight for its life, by the way. Because it doesn't have any chips for these mobile devices. They are not low power enough. And uh, so most of these guys are using chips based on a design from a company called ARM and made by companies like Texas Instruments and Qualcomm, Samsung. Apple uses Samsung chips. Apple's even designing its own chips, and that's got to scare Intel incredibly because Apple's its biggest customer on the desktop side. And if Apple were to, and I suspect this is what Apple's planning, they have a lot of chip designers if Apple were to say, you know, we're going to make our own chips for everything, this would be very bad news for Intel. So Intel's scrambling a little bit. That's good. Intel likes it. Intel likes to be hungry. I think this is a company that likes to be under the gun. They really, they really only perform. Remember, the last time was when AMD started eating their lunch, and they really performed. They came back and they said they started making great chips again. And they're getting a little complacent. I think that, that this is good that Apple and the, and the mobile platforms are challenging Intel. So the TikTok cycle, a tick in the TikTok release cycle is, a, is an improvement in manufacturing. Generally speaking, it's the ability to make the chip smaller. The talk is a big improvement on the chip itself, the, what they call the microarchitecture, what's going on inside the chip. And that's where you see the biggest speed improvements. We're ready for a talk. A talk is coming in June, and its name be Haswell. Lo and behold, the chip was given unto us, the Haswell. And all were happy and glad across the land, except people who had bought a computer in February and March and April. Almost certain that Apple will, in fact, because they always do this, as soon as there's a new chip, jump to the market. And why do you want a Haswell? Because, well, you, there's going to be three Haswell parts, a, th a Haswell, a low-power Haswell, and a super-duper low-power Haswell. And th this is why you want the Haswell. Not only will it be faster, with better in uh, built-in graphics which the MacBook Airs use, but it will be much lower power. We should be able to see big increases in battery life. They're going to start, battery life's going to start looking like tablets, you know, the 10-hour battery life. Wouldn't you love a MacBook Air with a 10-hour battery life and faster? That's, I think, what's coming. And it may even be why Apple's dropping the prices, trying to clear out the existing stock. Uh, so a talk is coming. It applies to Windows 8, too. You know, uh, the, there are some beautiful Windows 8 machines out there right now. But battery life almost universally is, is in the four- to five-hour range. We could perhaps get it 50% to 100% better. So it's going to be interesting. It's also interesting to note that Microsoft, just like Apple, is starting to ramp up its ARM versions of Windows. That's what Windows RT is. And this is, again, this is terrifying for Intel. So Good. A little, <laughs> there's a there's a little bit of a burr in Intel's saddle, a little kick to the hindquarters, and Intel's kind of revving up, and I think it's exciting. I think we might see something very exciting coming out this summer. When Haswell's released in June, I don't know exactly when the ultra-low power versions will be released, probably within a few months. I'm thinking you're going to want to watch carefully in late summer, early fall for hot 
or in this case, cool new Windows 8 and Macintosh laptops. And then we all want laptops, don't we? Don't get me started on the desktop Macintosh, the Mac Pro. I got a new iMac, love it. A lot, of the, a lot of the folks who do video editing, Photoshop, all that heavy-duty processing say, where's our new Mac Pro? There hasn't been one in years. Well, maybe there'll be a Haswell Mac Pro. I don't know. All right, so that was very geeky. I apologize. Let's talk about anything you want. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's my number. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <clears throat> Haswell's better than Ivy Bridge. I'll show you the, a great article on Anand if you want to really get into the details of Haswell. IT, it could be the worst job in the world. It could be the best job in the world. It's a great job. He has an excellent... Uh, this came out in uh, October. Anand wrote, Haswell Architecture analyzed building a new PC and a new Intel. And a lot of what I was talking about with Intel's challenges comes from this argu argument. There is no one better than Anand. Anand Shimpy. Boy, he's been doing this since he was 14. Um, and he really, but he has the charts in here from IDF, Intel Developer Forum. And this is what you're looking at. You're looking at l super low power parts here. Lower power than Ivy Bridge. And we get that, we get that power management improved because the power management is on chip. We get these new sleep states, which are very interesting. See, right now, what, one of the things that's happening is your tablet and your phone, you know, even when they're off, they're, you know, they're checking mail. They're doing stuff in the background. And Apple's started implementing this as well. What do they call it? Nap? In their, huh? Power nap. In their, uh, in their laptops. Windows cannot do this. Windows 8 can, but it needs the hardware. And so that's something people really want, this low-wake latency sleeping state. Actually, what you want is S0, which is the current awake state, but you want these new idle states, S0I1, actually it's S0IX because it's 1, 2, 3, which effectively are almost as low power as sleep, but still they can get mail, they can do the kind of stuff you want, and they do it by, and this is why you need Windows 8, activity alignment. Because right now, Windows 7, whatever wakes up, says, give me some time. I need to do something. You want it all to happen in, in a cycle so you can get more sleep time. That's going to improve battery life. Um, Haswell, look at this. This is CPU idle power. <laughs> you know, just dramatic. This is a really good article. And he's, most of these slides are from IDF, the Intel Developers Forum. Tegra is an ARM. So this is uh, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, and then uh, Haswell. So this is what we're waiting for. There's also their Clover Trail, which is a, more of an ARM competitor. I don't know how important that's going to be. <clears throat> so this, and this is coming soon. That's the key on all this. So, good article if you want to read that. It's from back from October uh, from IDF. I don't know if, I, you know, I didn't skip Ivy Bridge. I have Ivy Bridge in a number of machines, but, um, and there's some benefits, you know, USB 3. And, uh, yeah, I'll give you the link. Chat room, here comes my link. Yeah, you're right. Because the Mac Pro is a Xeon family, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be a, um, a, a you know comparable to a Xeon. So you're right; they're going to wait, which might be why he's you know we're thinking. I don't know. I don't know nothing about the Mac Pro. I'm so mad at Posturus. So mad at Posturus. Yeah. I have you know I used Posturus. I can mention that too. Leo Laporte, that tick-tock. It's very important to remember. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. I have lots of calls, and I'm going to answer lots of calls today. I'm just in the mood. So let's start with John. He's on the line from Jonesboro, Tennessee. Hey, John. Hello, Leo. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking my call. I'm a first-time caller and a huge fan of you and the Twit Network. Well, I bless you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate your support. 
Twit is our podcast network, I should mention, for those who are saying, did he just call him a twit? Yes, this is a, we're twits. <laughs> Stands for this week in tech. It's okay. And I'm actually watching you right now on my Roku box, but I'm having a problem with my Roku box, and that's what I was calling about today. Okie dokie. Um, I have an 8 meg DSL connection, and when I connect on my laptop and I run speedtest.net, I'm getting close to 7 megs sitting in my living room where the Roku box is. On my Roku box, I've turned the debugging on, uh, so when it starts um, and it plays, it tells me uh, how fast I'm connecting. Yeah. And so... Um, it's telling me that I'm only getting one meg whenever I connect to my Roku box. Yeah, that's really not enough for a good quality high def. No. And um, I've done a bunch of things that the Roku forums say to do. I've changed the DNS to open DNS. Good. I have, that won't um, speed up the download speeds, but it might speed up the connections. Hey, are right. you on wired or wireless? It's wireless. Well, there's problem number one. Okay. Uh, whenever possible, I try to get... Uh, Internet connected media devices on wire. They, yeah. it's just faster. There's always a little overhead with wireless. There's also, you know, m more conflicts, uh, both on uh, the RF frequencies and uh, just with other traffic. And I, I just think wired is so much better. You know, I have a, a very similar problem because my cable uh, modem's uh, uh, router is in in downstairs, and upstairs I have a media center, so. Even though what I did was I, I got a media, you know, wireless extender. I have an Airport Extreme downstairs, an Airport Express upstairs, and then I hardwire to the Airport Express. I don't get the same kind of performance as I do downstairs where I'm direct connected to the modem. It makes a huge difference. Now, going from 7 megabits to 1 megabit is pretty bad. Right. Now, and I but I think, you'd get, I think you'd get back to 3 or 4 megabits at least, which is more than enough for Roku. Right. And I can do a soft reset on the uh, Roku, and it will say seven megs. But after it's oh, run for just a few minutes, then I lose the lose all the bandwidth on my computer. Oh, well, that's really interesting. I wonder why that is. Is it a, a late model Roku? Um, it is the. Uh, let me look at it. It's an LT. So just to explain to folks, we're talking about a box that is really cool. R O K U Labs dot com. And uh, what or actually they may be just Roku.com now. And what they what it does is it's a set top box. This is a big category. These are uh, devices that connect your television system or your home theater system to the internet. Roku, one of my favorites. There's lots of them. Apple makes one, of course. Google makes a number, and so forth. But Roku is one of my favorites. Um, it, it connects either via Wi-Fi or uh, via wired. Um, they start at forty nine dollars. Although the one you want is 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 probably not the forty nine dollar one. So you have you have a Roku two. That's my yeah. It's an LT. So that's the low end, um, purple box version. Right. Uh, you know it it doesn't do a uh, high ten eighty p anyway. It does it doesn't go higher than seven twenty. Um, I wonder if getting a, a newer Roku, the XD or the XS, would make a difference. I don't think you need the XS, but because uh, that's the motion control, kit, remote control, so you can play. Oh, actually, you know what? Ethernet port is only available on the Roku XS, it looks like. So you don't even have that choice, do you? Right. You're wireless yeah. only. Well, you know, it's it's another 50 bucks. <laughs> it's $99. Right. I think you'd get better results. Are you near the Ethernet? I mean, could you plug it in if you were if you got it? Yes, I think I could. I hate to say spend fifty bucks, but really, John, that's that's going to be worth it. You get higher quality video. You get you know HDMI. You get uh, a, a faster processor. I'm almost certain that you'll get better uh, uh, throughput. Okay. I hate to say, did you just get the LT? No, I've had it for a while. Um, well, you got your money's worth then. Yeah, it, it's just sort of strange. This seems like it's just been a recent thing. So. Yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be. It's overheating. Does it feel hot? No, I don't think so. You know, they don't. I mean, these things are not. Uh, these are not computer processors in no. here. They're they're slower ARM processors and sometimes really slow. Sometimes, uh, you know, not fast enough to do everything you want. That's one of the big differences of the LT and the higher models. It can't do 1080p because its processor is too slow. Uh, could be Wi-Fi issues as well. Could be, for instance, you see neighbors now on your uh, Wi-Fi when you scan for your Wi-Fi ID. 
Actually, I live in the country, and so I don't have any neighbors. Isn't that nice? Now. I'm jealous. See, I even checked. It said online to change the channel on your wireless, and so I did You that. tried that? Yeah, that's really for neighbors, not for... Although you can have other devices in that, you know, 2.4 gigahertz. The reason Wi-Fi used it is because there's no regulation. So baby monitors use it. Cell phones use it. A lot of stuff uses it. Do you have the ability to go to 5 gigahertz? I, can't, I don't know if the Roku is dual band or not. I, sh I, I can't. I can't see that on here. Um, I think wired would be the best thing you can do, and that means getting the newer Roku. Right. Okay. Worth it, John. It really is. All right. Thank you, Lee. All right. All right, John. Yeah, I, I, it's hard. It could be other things, of course. You could be able to fix it. It's definitely not interference. Uh, you know, check your router. Maybe update the firmware. That's always a good idea. You know, there's certain things. If you call a tech guy, there's always, when you call the IT guy at work or, you know, you call your tech guy at home, there's always, well, did you reboot it? <laughs> okay. Did you did you update the drivers? Okay. Did you update the firmware? Okay. There's certain things you just do, even though they may not fix anything. Uh, yeah, don't hotwire your, you're right, Superman in our chat room says, do not hotwire your microwave to run with the door open because that's also on 2.4 gigahertz, and that'll really mess up with your Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that one. This is uh, this is our new slogan for the show from uh, the gray area. If you can't compute, you must reboot. Always reboot. <laughs> In fact, uh, there was a funny uh, YouTube viral video. Uh, what was the web was down? The web is down. The guy calls the IT uh, guy and says the web is down. The IT guy's playing Halo and he's like so bored. And uh, he says, well, it, the, and the guy says, well, I rebooted it three times like you told me. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good trick, the IT department. Reboot it, not once, not twice, three times. That'll keep you busy for about 20 minutes, and I can get on with my game. Another one, blow the dust out of the connector. That's right, Bram Master, Bramster. <laughs> um, it is true, though, that uh, uh, wireless routers, routers in general, uh, often have firmware updates that fix things, not just reliability and speed, but sometimes security is probably always, uh, you know, every few months worth checking. Sometimes even a new router will improve that. Wi-Fi is, um, Wi-Fi, we, for instance, we use a lot of Skype calls on our uh, podcasts, video Skype, and we always tell people don't use Wi-Fi. It's just unpredictable. Wireless is unpredictable. 8888 Ask Leo. Yeah, we'll put a, it's kind of, there's some profanity in the server is down. It's really good, though. Uh, Iceman has put a link in the chat room. We'll put that in the show notes, and we'll just put a little warning, adults only. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Our uh, tech guy podcast brought to you today by our friends at ringcentral.com. Did you see uh, on the tech guy lab site, I, I mentioned this earlier, that uh, our hero of the week, of the month, that even better. Is Russell Tammany? He's our uh, he's our engineer. He's a con consulting engineer. It looks like he's floating with his in his in the lotus position in this picture. And you know what? He kind of does float. He is an amazing guy. His company is Exponentia, and I was really glad that he uh, he was here. He's from the very beginning worked on the IT and did a beautiful job setting up the Brickhouse Studios. And it was the guy I went to when we said we got to do a phone system and. It's kind of a weird coincidence because he said Ring Central, and we went and we tried. We you know looked at the site and we looked at the features and we said okay let's set up Ring Central. And it was about a week later that Ring Central called us and said, "Would you like to do ads for Ring Central?" And I said, "Well, as it so happens, we're installing a Ring Central system right now. So give us some time with it, and I'll tell you if we like it. Uh, yeah, I'll be glad to do ads. Well, I tell you what, we do like it, and we're still using it. Our staff loves it. It is a really great uh, solution." Basically, you know, now now that we're a real business, we need a, a real phone system. And I thought that meant we have to go to the phone company, you know, uh, and uh, AT&T and say, and they'd put a PBX in the basement and they'd charge us to program it and all that stuff. And so I was really glad to see that we didn't have to do that. This is all of the features of a PBX and then some, but there, but there is no hardware in the basement. There's no setup fee. There's no startup cost. Uh, it's as low as $20 a month per user. And that includes long distance uh, and a lot of other features. Unlimited calling, a, a thousand toll-free minutes a month, unlimited internet fax, unlimited extensions. We set up the, the phone tree ourselves. We record the 
we can have music on hold, or we can record the. If you call our 800 number, you get our phone tree with an auto receptionist to dial by name directory. All of our we kept our existing phone number, including our 800 number, which is really nice. You get a, a Ring Central app on your iPhone or your Android phone that lets you call from your Android or iPhone via Ring Central, and even and so, the incoming uh, or outbound calls look like they're coming from our 800 number. They now have business text, so you can text from your Ring Central app on your smartphone, and it looks like it's coming from our business number. So it's business uh, text messaging as well. Just really, really sweet. And right now, when you uh, go to ringcentral.com and use the offer code TWIT or call 800-543-9980, you'll get two-for-one phone deal. For every phone you buy, they'll give you another phone up to a total of 20 phones. Ringcentral.com. We've been using it now for almost two years and are thrilled. Take a look at it. Go to the website. Then try the uh, free 30-day trial. Ringcentral.com. I think you're going to really like it. It is a really fabulous system. And we thank them so much for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Kate Upton got to Antarctica. <laughs> hey, Dave. All right, you want to get a picture, Dave, while we, uh, before you have to uh, run? Droid. Droid. Mythbuster, Chris Marquardt coming up at 12.30. I see. I see. I like it. If you can't compute, you must reboot. That's good. That is good. So, Dr. Mom, what do you think? Mucinex? D? I could send somebody out to get it. Hey, Beatmaster, where are you now? Oh, Futures and Biotech's new site and showtime, 4.30 p.m. Tuesday, futuresandbiotech.com. I will, Mark Pelletier. Four thirty Eastern. I'll mention it. I'll try to remember to mention it on Twit. Be, best thing to do, be in the chat room and bug me on Twit. Mucinex just makes the mucus more liquid. Ew. Afrin, huh? Afrin opens the head up. I don't know if that sounds better. Well, one day would be enough. If anybody's heading to the drugstore, pick me up some Afrin. You got time? Yeah, you know where the you know where the drugstore is, right? They're right on the on Washington, there's a CVS. Afrin, huh? Do my doctor is prescribed. Wait a minute. Brian's saying, no, Afrin. <laughs> Clarinex. I, just, I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's allergies. Afrin is addictive. <laughs> I 
Eat salsa. Wait a minute. I don't know. Coconut oil. What? Pull? I don't even know what that sounds awful. How about Ipratopium bromide nasal spray? Yeah, let's just wait. <laughs> we haven't, the, we're getting multiple opinions. <laughs> Straw poll. <laughs> well, I don't want to be loopy for twit. Coconut oil in a neti pot, really? Now, I have a little congestion, you know, a little, uh, I'm getting over a cold, but it's a bad cold season, cold and flu season this year, isn't it? And uh, yesterday I was really under the weather. I'm feeling better today, but it's still a little congested, so I foolishly asked the chat room. And my and my own personal chat physician, Dr. Mom, said uh, Afrin, and then everybody in the chat room said, no, not that, and there were about 800 different recommendations. And now I'm very confused. <laughs> Maybe I'll just muddle through. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'll just muddle muddle through. How about that? Uh, let's continue on with the calls. So ex excuse me if I sound a little congested. That's what's going on. Dave in Jamestown, New York. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, hey James. Joe. Hey. Great to talk to you. Well, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Well, I heard you talking about the the Microsoft. I think it's the three sixty five. Is a subscription service? Yeah, this is the new uh, Office. And Microsoft is really confusing me and others uh, because there was Office 365, which was fully web-based. It was uh, Microsoft's response to Google Docs. Um, but now they've got the new Microsoft Office, <laughs> which is Office 2013, which includes Office 365, and I think this is what they want. They, I tell you, Microsoft, I love their products. I hate the company. They just can't see. It's a very muddled messaging, and this is a good example of it where, well, what I don't understand. What do you want me to do, Microsoft? What? Just tell me because I need to use Word, and it's just confusing. So here's what I think is the right thing to do right now, and this is certainly what Microsoft wants you to do. You can go to Office 365 and you can rent Office. Um, but it, but look at all the plans. There's hosted mail for $4 a month, but that's just mail. Then there's small business, which is email, messaging, web-based viewing editing of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote. So that's kind of more like Office. That's $6 a month. Okay, so 6 times 12, that's, uh, what, $72. For $100 a month, you can, uh, I mean, a year, $100 a year, you can buy Office 2013, which gives you Office Pro on five desktops, plus all of the above. Yeah, see, that sounds like a good deal. It's kind, it kind of is the one I decided on, because I'm so confused. So what I so you get five five copies of Office and by the way this can be Mac or Windows so I I have two copies of, three copies of Mac and two copies of Windows in use I still get Office three sixty five and that's hundred dollars a year hundred dollars a year so I think that's a that's a that's probably a good way to go because you do get more power in the desktop versions of of these programs than you do in the online only versions. Now, can I ask you about Adobe? Because I think Adobe... They're doing it, too. So Adobe Studio is now subscription, too. And I tell you, it's smart from their point of view because you buy more than you need, <laughs> right? Because if you well, get if you get the, the new Creative Suite subscription, you get every one of their tools. But you may not really use Fireworks or Contribute or Flash Paper. Right. <laughs> well, according to the, I think the way I read it on their website is because I have an older version of the suite, and they have it now where I can get it, I believe, for thirty bucks a month. Right, and I think that's attractive. It it seems too good to be true. Though. No, it doesn't. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> that's three hundred sixty dollars a year, each and every year. So. It, how often did you buy Sweet? Well, I guess Sweet's pretty expensive. It's like twelve hundred. How much is Sweet? Twelve hundred bucks. Well, the, the Master Suite is over two thousand. Two thousand. And don't and you, with the Creative Cloud, do you get everything? That's the way I read it. Yeah. But I'm not one hundred percent. So I I agree. It's a good deal if you use all those apps. If you just wanted Photoshop, 
I don't know well, if that guess, would be a good deal. I guess you can get one program for 20 bucks a month. Right. So, yeah, we, well, I'll tell you, I, I haven't done anything. I'm still on Photoshop, though, two versions ago. What is it? Seven, yeah, five. I'm on like four versions. And, and they know that. They know there's a lot of us out here who didn't want to pay the upgrades, who kind of looked with envy at the new features. Because every time there's a new Photoshop, every year they have kind of nice new features. But just can't pull the trigger at, you know, seven or eight hundred bucks. So this is easy. This is painless. The the other question I had was, do you have to be connected to the Internet at no. all times to use these programs? No, I don't think so. I think what happens is you download the apps, you use them, and periodically it will check to make sure you're okay. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't want to be disconnected for a long time. We use it here. Hey, maybe somebody in my staff who's using it can tell me how often it checks. Um, the full crew, I mean, you, you could spend a lot of money if you want to get the full creative cloud for teams, it's $70 a month, but that, this is the thing. Uh, these companies, Microsoft's wanted to do this for years, Adobe's too, because they realize people don't upgrade. Uh, and so they've got people sitting on Adobe, uh, Photoshop three, and they really want to get some money out of them and they haven't had any money out of them for years. So it's so smart to do this because, hey, well, I can afford $30, $30 a month. Is that all? Really? That's not bad. $20 a month for Photoshop? That's not bad. And over the few years that you're going to pay for it, it's probably about the same revenue to Adobe, but it's just less painful to say $20 a month. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. it you're, you have a good question. If you're never on the Internet, it's probably not a good idea. But I don't, I don't know how often it checks, but I don't think it checks that often. Oh, and, and uh, Boy is telling me in the chat room, that's an introductory price. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think it's yeah, for the first year. <laughs> right. So for existing users. So, again, they just kind of ease you in. Yeah. Um, Mark in Boston says, Creative Cloud doesn't require you to be online all the time. You, you get online, you, you authorize, you download the apps, and they live on your computer. But I bet you it periodically checks. It's got to. Otherwise, you know, their big fear is piracy. So this this eliminates piracy, certainly will increase their revenue, and it's always updated. So that's good too. Now on on the Microsoft, you got five computers. On, on the Adobe, are you are you locked into one computer? I don't remember what the license is. I'm I in the past, Adobe's allowed you to put it on a desktop and a laptop. I don't know what the uh, license is okay. well, for this. You should probably check. Um, Thank you, Leo. Yeah, I think it's it's you know. <laughs> People have figured out there's a lot of psychology that goes in pricing now. People are smart. These guys are smart, and they've learned a lot. There's a great book called uh, Predictably Irrational by a guy named Dan Ariely. He is an economist, uh, an economic psychologist, I guess maybe would be more apt, who, who has done a lot of research using uh, econo econometric tools into how humans make decisions. And it's, it's not rational. It's irrational, but it's predictably irrational. And marketers can use this in all sorts of clever ways. And here's one. You could give me $1,200 now and own a program for life or for just $20 a month for the rest of the program, maybe $40 next year. And Adobe's made the calculation. I'm sure it, uh, it's e it feels better for us and it makes more money for them. It's a win-win. Um, and we're moving in that direction. One of the things that makes this possible is always on internet connections, the cloud. It makes it more desirable. Uh, and Boy also points out that if you're a subscriber, new features are rolled out to you first. They've really they've sweetened this pot. It, it's it makes a lot of sense. Behavioral finance says Web zero six three nine. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Carmen Joseph, happy birthday, 48 years old today. A child, a mere child. We're not allowed to do birthday greetings on broadcast, you know. That's actually explicitly against Business the is all about communication, rules. right? But, not I think because the fear would be we'd do that nonstop. That Adobe CEO ha shows how to dodge price gouging questions. The privacy. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Adobe's in hot water in Australia over the high pricing of its Creative Suite applications. Recently, the company has been asked to justify the disparities which have left frugal Australians flying to America. Is that why you're here, Peter MacArthur King? Flying to America rather than buying a copy at home. 
control who has access by using tools like that. At a public hearing March 22nd, many have questioned why Adobe and others have such widely differing prices. Australians pay $1,400 more for Creative Suite than U.S. residents. And it's, it's exchange rate, right? And no, it's just greed. There's no excuse. Click on the microphone, enter my It's it's across the board price. Apple does it. Everybody does it. <clears throat> and the excuse they give is that well, the exchange rate fluctuates so wildly, we can't be sure. And, but that's not true. The Australian dollar has been very consistent compared to the U.S. Yeah, it's been very very consistent. Fourteen hundred dollars more. All right. Well, let's let's watch him. Let's watch uh, Adobe's CEO answer the big questions about price gouging. Games or just watching a family slideshow. Check out the new 3020 and 5020 Ultra Black 2D and 3D projectors. They're also built in wireless. These projectors are still the only way to get truly. I don't hear. I want to hear this. I think I have to change my uh, system preferences. Sound. Yeah. Output. Uh, I mic. Input. I mic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I hear nothing. Oh, I really want to hear this. John, why can't I hear my... Uh... Is it turned down? No. I hear that. I hear that. And I'll, I'll... Oh, here we go. No, my readers... Here we go. up to 1400 dollars more for the exact same software delivered in australia um delivered over the internet with no box copy compared to u.s prices again and I'll, I'll answer this question when we look at the creative cloud and where the future of the creative cloud is so we're not talking about we're talking about traditional of, software you know, not we're creative headed with with the company and we think that's the best offering for customers we really believe that that <laughs> he's know, not even he's just ignoring it there. Uh, it's actually a great value. It's a good CEO. Uh, to our customers. It's a great value. We think that's the future of the company, and uh, I think it's a very attractive opportunity but, right now. But, but, but it's fourteen hundred dollars more. Of, of, to be honest, I mean, there's a lot of companies, a lot of individuals who don't want to buy a Creative Cloud. They want to buy a Creative Suite, and I mean, the Creative Suite Master Collection is fourteen hundred dollars more in Australia. But how can you possibly justify that when it's delivered over the internet? Again, the Creative Cloud just. <laughs> Is not just for individuals. This is why I love the internet. You can't get away with this anymore. The collaboration features that you have with Creative Cloud for Teams is the better opportunity, even for Teams. <laughs> it just doesn't. It's like he's a poli This guy should run for your office. Of what we're doing with the huh? Creative Cloud and the Marketing Cloud. I, I yeah, the guy in the back is saying, "I don't, I don't want to." I don't want to. Is that the Creative Cloud is the future of Creative? And you know, when you look at no, the I'll pass. I guess there seems to be a real dissent in the uh, chat room. Dr. Mom is a physician. We just think that that's phenomenal value for our customers. But what about the customers who want to buy traditional versions? Dr. Mom, what would you like for lunch? Which is still the majority of Adobe's business. I, mean, I know you're talking a lot about the Creative Cloud in the future, but if that's the case, why not cut the prices of, why not harmonize the prices of your... Let me tell you how great the Creative Cloud is. If the Creative Cloud is the future. When Adobe thinks about how we want to make sure we attract the next generation, again, I... I, I the future <laughs> of the creative is the creative cloud. I'm sorry, sir. You're... Cloud, <laughs> the sky. All right, Leo, go to your library. Cloudy. It's a little cloudy out Sometimes there. Sometimes I think it's hanging down. If you feel bad, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Great article uh, on The Verge. <laughs> I got, this is great. So we were talking earlier about uh, Adobe and how they have this new product, the Creative Cloud, a subscription product. And... Uh, and but you could still buy, you know, the other products, Photoshop and so forth. Uh, but it's very expensive. Apparently in Australia, it's fourteen hundred dollars more than it is in the U.S. to buy the Creative Suite. And there's a great. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes to the video. There's a great article on uh, The Verge with Adobe's CEO um, Shantanu Narayan uh, being asked by Australian journalist. Why is it fourteen hundred dollars more in uh, Australia than it is in the U.S.? Why is it why is it fourteen hundred dollars more expensive? And he's a master at he just doesn't answer. He's better than any U.S. politician. He's so on point by just saying, "Well, let me tell you about the Creative Cloud instead." What? <laughs> no answer from Adobe about this. 
Why is it more expensive in Australia? Apparently, it's so much more expensive. Australians use the difference to fly to the U.S. and buy the product than fly home. You get a little vacation on top of it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Same thing happens in Canada. I know there's, a, there's, there's. It's, it's. I guess it's a kind of gouging. Uh, hardware manufacturers do it too. Their excuse is, well, the exchange rate fluctuates. We can't be sure what it's going to be, so we just have to charge that much. Have you ever bought a paperback book in Canada? In fact, just look at it. When you buy a paperback book, I know, does anybody buy paperbacks anymore? But when you buy a paperback book, look on the back, and they'll have a U.S. price, and then they'll have a Canadian price. And uh, it's, you know, it's twice as much as if the Canadian dollar is worth half the American dollar, but it's not. In fact, there have been times in the last few years where the Canadian dollar has been worth more. And uh, that's just how they do it. That's just how they do it. Of course, when we need drugs, where do we go to buy them? Canada. <laughs> this is what you're really seeing, and there is a tech angle to this. What you're really seeing is, in the old days, it didn't matter because you couldn't tell. There wasn't, we didn't have this kind of direct communication. There was no way to put a video up on YouTube showing Adobe's CEO completely dodging the question. In the internet era, everybody knows everything. Globally, internationally, we know what people are paying for their seats on an airplane. We know what people are paying in Canada for drugs we could buy here. And and so all of this scheming starts to break down. All this variable pricing, which was very beneficial to companies when nobody knew what was going on, is now public. And so it just uh, this is why the Internet empowered consumer is so dangerous to many companies and why companies are floundering in the Internet era. We, we know too much. We know too much. Don't you love it? Paul in El Paso, Texas. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Paul. Hey, hey Leo. Hey, on that note, I uh, just came back from the Philippines, and uh, I bought a Beats audio headset over there for about 500 pesos. And uh, in American dollars, that's about $12. If you buy the headset here, it's about 200 Wow. Yeah. It's not counterfeit? Yeah. That's the real deal? No, it came in the real box and everything. Wow. Them to, you know, and when I've seen them over here, and sure enough, I got that deal. It's awesome. It's almost worth going to the Philippines. Just stock up. <laughs> yeah. Um, the reason I'm calling, Leo, is the uh, I, I sent my uh, computer out to Best Buy. It had a, a broken webcam. Yeah. And before I sent it out, I did a backup on my external hard drive. And I really want to try doing this. I think they're good. I asked them, and I think they did not... Um, uh, they did not, you know, wipe the computer out. Um, but I did take some photos and some other information off the computer before I sent it out. So I'm just kind of wondering. I did leave some photos of, like, golf courses and some outside things on there, you know, that you know, I just didn't care, you know, if anybody saw those. And uh, I'm just wondering now if I do a, a system restore from my external hard drive back uh, to the computer, um, if, I, if, if, it had, if it hadn't been wiped out, but I just want to do a restore anyways. What am I up against? Is that going to screw it all up? Or No, I don't think so. What did you back it up with? Uh, it's a, it's a, what do you call it, Toshiba Canvio uh, 500 hard drive. Or and it had its built, it had it was one of those push button backups that it had its own software. Yeah, it had its own software, and yeah. it, 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 now I'm looking. I can look. On Gen generally, it see it depends on the software, but most software, when you do a restore onto a hard drive that already has all those files, will just restore stuff that's not on the hard drive. It won't it? Won't give you duplicates? That's what you're worried about, of course. Yeah, I just just I, I didn't know if it was going to cause a disruption or. or well, I can't I can't promise you because I don't know how this can be how this particular system works. Maybe somebody in the chat room does. Um, but generally it's, it, I mean, th this is something that happens all the time. You do a restore to a hard drive that already has data on it. You only restore stuff that's not there. Oh, okay. And that, it, so I think you'd be, I think you'd be all right. It okay. probably, it, uh, it might even say, you might even just start the process and see what it says. It might even say, ah, would you like me to replace the stuff that's already there or just the stuff that's not? It might even give you that choice. Oh, okay. All right. I just never done it before, so I thought I'd. Ask. Yeah, I haven't with that particular setup, um, so I I can't vouch for that setup. But I, I I can't imagine they do it much differently than everybody else. If it's an image restore, and you know you backed up an image of your hard drive, it will overwrite the original, 
and you'll have just what you backed up and and no more. Might be prudent to make a second backup of differences. Um, make a make a new backup that is the old drive as it came back. So then you'll have the old drive as is. But I think you I, you know generally speaking, that's something that backup could do automatically and without problem. So here's a great here's a great follow up to that Valentine's Day article on the Verge of the CEO of Adobe hedging after being asked why they're price gouging. The company has now slashed the cost of its subscriptions in the in the United in Australia to match that charge in the United States. The internet wins again. Don't you love it? It's kind of got to be kind of embarrassing to the, the Adobe CEO, David Northridge, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, David. Well, hi, Leo. I just let you know that uh, my wife listens to you. She got carbonite because of you. She, Good. She loves it. It's peace of mind. Where you know, let's hope the, nobody's going to have a disaster like that. Let's hope, but it happens. You know what happens. So it's just the peace of mind that those those really you know critical things like baby pictures or whatever that you can't replace they're safe. That's right. And speaking of baby pictures, um, I'm retired. And my retirement hobby is photography, and and I have an APS uh, Pentax K5, and I thought, well, gee, I'll get me one of those full frame cameras because I hear the photos are so much better. So I rented a uh, Nikon D3. Yeah. It has 16 megapixels um, as as my. Uh, Pentax does. I put it on a tripod and I had real comparable lenses and I uh, took like 15 photos and several of them I made in the 20 by 30 uh, enlargements. I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. You know, the K5 wow. is very nice. That is a nice, I, I think it's an excellent uh, camera. I'm trying to see what the, the uh, it's an APS-C, which is a fairly large sensor. So the full frame D3 is, well, you know what, let's hold on a second and talk some more because this is an important uh, distinction people should understand. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. One of the things I like about uh, our Tech Guy podcast and our advertisers on the Twit Network is they're they're all stuff we use, and uh, and we really make a point of that. We we turn away. Oh, somebody's calling our eight hundred number. <laughs> Let me put do not disturb on. <laughs> I was talking about Ring Central. Somebody's decided. I I think I'm going to try the phone tree. Um. This is an, another product that uh, we use all the time now, and I love it. It's called uh, X-Print Server from a company called Lantronics. It's just this little little box here. But boy, is this cool. So you know uh, Apple added this new feature to its iOS called AirPrint, right? And if you have an AirPrint-compatible printer, then when you use your iPad or your iPhone and you select the print command, here, I'll go to, uh, like if you're in Safari... And uh, and you want to and you want to print a web page. You select the print command, right? But you've got to have a compatible printer, otherwise you have to buy special software and drivers and stuff. Well, this is a great solution. It makes any printer AirPrint compatible, including USB printers, which are not normally on the network. So actually, this is a side benefit. This puts all your printers on the network, even USB printers. So the way this works is you plug that into your router. You plug, uh, there's the USB port. You plug the printer into there. You give it power, and that's it. Boom, all of a sudden, up to eight USB printers, uh, up to two network printers are all available and visible, and they you can print to them from your iPad or your iPhone. And all those USB printers now become network printers that you can print to from any device that prints to a network printer. That's the $99 X-Print server for home. And they also have a $199 version for Office that is even more powerful, allows you to use eight USB printers and unlimited network printers. It also uh, does all of the networking stuff, you know, the Active Directory remote authentication, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what's nice about both of these is they couldn't be simpler to use. There's no configuration required. You just plug it in. It finds the printers automatically. It just works. I mean, it really is kind of amazing. If you're going to put more than one printer on here, you want to put eight printers, of course, you're going to use a USB hub and plug it in. Um, there's no software, no configuration, no apps, nothing. It just works. Really, really nice. Highly recommend it. And if you uh, go to xprintserver.com slash twit, you'll get free shipping. I just saw somebody in the chat room said um, uh, that he did that, and he was really grateful for the free shipping, and he really loves the xprint server. 
Very nice. Love it. You will too. xprintserver.com slash twit if you want to find out more and get free shipping on xprint server. Well, and that, it's a good question. When you're backing up, uh, for instance, we don't back up the SAN because it's terabytes of data, and there's no one, there's not enough bandwidth in the world to back it up. It's not storage, it's ba bandwidth. If mailing and shipping are an important part of running your small... We have 150 megabits up, right? That's a lot of bandwidth. And you still can't back up terabytes in any reasonable amount of time. So the SAN is... Uh, uh, we just rely on it. It's a SAN, so it has multiple drives, so it has some redundancy. But what happens with the SAN is we actually delete the stuff. Be once a show is done, what did we wait, a week, a month? I can't remember, but we wait a certain period of time. Once a show is done, it is uploaded, so it, the show itself is offsite, but we don't save the work parts. Three months? All right. It depends on the size of the SAN. We save as much as we can. Right. And as soon as we start doing HD, that changed, yeah. Plus, now we have the file server, so a lot of stuff is getting backed up to the file server. Right. But we don't back up off-site because you can't back up off-site. It's too big and it takes too long. So we have a we have a file server which we back up the mezzanines to probably, right? So on lunch? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I left it here. I just ran out the door. I went to bed. I slept from 3 to like 9, 30 or 10. <laughs> um, yes. Well, yeah, let me see what the soup is uh, today. More soup. They said I shouldn't use Afrin. I should use something spicy to get my sinuses. Mustard. Vegetarian barley, minestrone, butternut squash, chicken tamale chili. That'll work, huh? All right, let's... Um, I want some minestrone, a big minestrone. That sounds good. That sounds healthful. It sounds delicious. It'll work, but only for an hour or so. So, Dr. Mom, really, I'm going to send somebody out. Should I get Afrin? What about it being addictive? What about what about what they said, Doctor Mom, where it it uh it op it it, it, it that it the the re the re re what the rebound is worse than the original. I use saline uh, nasal spray all the time. I'm addicted to it. Oh, I don't want Afrin kickback. I always get nervous. <laughs> no, I can't, Doctor Mom. I can't. I, I'm in the middle of a radio show. <laughs> first first one's not addictive. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't use it for long. I just, you know, I, I don't like cold medicines. I don't usually take cold remedies because I do feel like it's better just to suffer and just kind of get it over with, right? Just use it for a day. I use a, I use a, it's called Neil Med. It's like a neti pot. It's a saline rinse. It goes right through your sinus. But I can't when it's congested. It won't. It just bounces off. I'll be like uh, Rush Limbaugh. I'll be addi addicted to Afrin. Doctor's worst nightmare. Asking the chat room. <laughs> Too many opinions. I love it. Mentholatum up the nose, crushed garlic, jalapenos. You're tuned to Premier Channel 7. <laughs> it's not self-loathing, Frankie the Waffle. It's just letting the body work. Rest, lots of sleep, lots of fluids. Let the body do its job, right? I can't ask my doctor. I have Dr. Mom. My favorite 55-inch TV is a plasma, not an LED, and it's the uh, Panasonic Viera. Really love it. I have a, a 65 Viera. Uh, is it the GT? GT50. Love it. Ron Rico, baby. Purple label. <clears throat> I've taken Mucinex before and actually liked it. But I, I don't, it makes me nervous. It feels like it, it delays the cold. It's like, I don't know, that's probably superstition. I did get a flu shot this year. This is not the flu. This is just a sinus, post-cold sinus congestion. 
the external USB sound card. There's a lot of good choices out of Good Vibes, depending on how um, much money you want to spend. It, the, the low end, uh, the Griffin iMic is great. Um, you can spend up to uh, you know thousands of dollars for something like this. I think I don't think you need to. <clears throat> I agree. My my immune system is good. I have a strong immune system. Good. Glad you like the Lantronics teach. I'm about to do a Lantronics ad, actually. I don't know what the best powered hub is for a Raspberry Pi iMac. That's a good question. Yeah, there are quite a few, uh, actually. Uh, that would be kind of good. Win on X. Because I can't install it on my Fusion Drive here. Released February 21st. I'll have to try it. It's not emulation? That's the App Store. Ah. Oh, it's probably a, a version of Wine, huh? Yeah, I don't think it really matters exactly. Your Raspberry Pi is pretty insensitive to problems. Do I game on my Pi? I do, Hubble. I play. In fact, I... I had a okay. Now that you mention it, I almost should do this on the air. So I got Madden 13 for my Panasonic Vera 65 inch. It's really like watching football. It's so good. The quality so on my PS3. The quality is so good. You feel like you're actually. Like, is this a game? And I'm playing along and I'm having fun and I'm the Niners and I even downloaded the updated roster. So I got Colin Kaepernick as a quarterback. And then I got a kick, and I don't know how. There's no button for kick. So I look at the manual in the in the box. There's no manual in the box. It used to be they'd have all of that stuff in a manual in games, right? So it says, no, there's an online manual. So I read the online manual. Nowhere in the online manual does it say how to kick. So I'm trying to play the game, and I keep getting uh, penalties for delay a game because I'm trying to punt, and I can't. I have not yet played more than one, one down one series of downs because i can't kick so exactly it's so i asked henry's friends i said hey how do you kick he said well you pull it back and you push it forward it is not documented and i realized something and i think that the video game companies have a problem that's they probably just assume well if you're playing madden 13 you've played every other version of madden you know how to kick and I think it's true with Call of Duty, too. If you get Black Ops 2, they presume, oh, you know what you're doing. I think I think that this, this, the game companies now are at the point where they figure everybody's already is buying their third or fourth version of their game. So they don't... Uh... <laughs> That's right, Dr. Mom. <laughs> That's what I was trying to do. I like Uncharted. I played Uncharted too. In fact, I saw them record the music for that. It was wonderful. I th they don't include a manual anymore, and I think they just assume everybody knows how to kick. They show you the buttons, but they don't show you how to kick because it's a. It's not just a button. It's push, pull back, and push forward. It's kind of like. So I guess they can't. I don't know. It seems odd. I might have missed it. I but I I really looked for a long time because it was frustrating because I wanted to play the damn game. I was beating the Arizona Cardinals and everything, and I can't punt. Yeah, I did. I kicked the motion controller across the room. I'll show you a kick. <clears throat> yeah, I find uh, Henry's friend. I had to ask a teenager. Well, uh, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yes, you found it. This is it, the show that explains how technology works. It helps you work your way through technology problems, helps you buy cell phones or tablets or desktops or laptops. It helps you understand the Internet. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number if you want to ask a question, make a comment, make a suggestion. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. We've also got a great website where you can get links to our chat room. Lots of people in the chat room giving me medical advice. <laughs> you can join that crowd. Just go to techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com and follow the links there. Now, we started uh, right before the news, and I'm, I had to put you on hold, Dave, and I apologize. Talking to David in uh, Northridge. 
Hi, David. Hi. So you uh, have a very good camera, I think, a Pentax K5. It has, we're, and we're talking about sensor size. It has a sensor called an APS-C sensor. The rule of thumb is, there, of course, cameras, there's a lot of different features on a camera. Interchange the ability to interchange lenses, for instance, the uh, the the software in the camera, how fast it focuses, how it does its focusing, things like that. All of that is important. But uh, we often talk a lot about the sensor. That's in a way that's the film in a digital camera. It's the chip in the camera that receives the light that's coming through the lens and turns it into bits so the camera can record those bits. Uh, the APS-C, there's the biggest, well, there are many giant sensors out there, but but uh, the high-end professional DSLRs generally use something called a full-frame sensor, which is essentially the size of a frame of 35-millimeter film. That's why it's called full-frame. Um, less expensive SLRs, single-lens reflex cameras, interchangeable lens cameras, use an APS-C sensor, which is smaller. Um, it may be 50% uh, smaller. Actually, it's about, I think technically it's 60% smaller than a full frame. So in theory, something that's smaller is, even if it has the same number of pixels, now this is important, You can they're both 16 megapixels, right? Roughly. Right. Um, but it's the size of the pixel on the sensor, and the bigger the pixel, the more light sensitivity there is. And there is a measurable but but hard to describe difference in, in a bigger sensor it it the feeling is a little different it it its ability to distinguish fine lines is better things like that so low light sensitivity um and uh the performance of the uh, sensor are different but you know if you don't notice it it's not just how big your prints are um but if you don't notice a difference david well then you should probably keep using the k5 that's an excellent camera Excellent camera. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree. And I'm really happy with it, especially now. Right. Um, the the D3 that you uh, got is a very good Nikon full-frame camera. A lot of people like it. There are other things about it that you might say are better than the K5, the speed of focus, the burst mode, things like that. But if you're happy with the K5, I think it's an excellent camera. I don't have anything – I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, the only thing – I, I liked better about it was uh, if I took a portrait, you know, I could blur the background a lot easier with the full frame. Camera. Well, and that's because you have more light sensitivity, so you can use a wider aperture. Yeah. And that means, uh, or I'm sorry, a narrow, let's say, yeah, a wider aperture, which means that you can, uh, the depth of field, what's in focus gets narrower. Um, I I think that's the biggest difference is in low light performance. If you don't take, if you use lights or you take a lot of daylight shots, you don't need low light performance, then that you're probably fine. I, li I use a Canon uh, 5D Mark II, which is also full frame. And I, I do notice a difference. I have an APS-C, a number of APS-C cameras. I think APS-C is the smallest sensor for serious photography. Mm -hmm. I like it a lot. It's a good, it's a good sensor. My uh, Fujifilm X100 has an APS-C. And it's be beautiful images. Beautiful images. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much. Your, that sensor is so much bigger than a compact camera sensor, a point-and-shoot camera sensor, that it really is a lot better. Yeah, I agree. And uh, uh, what I like also about like, comparing the two cameras, the Nikon, the Pentax, the Pentax is a lot easier to lug around. Yeah, it's smaller. APS-C cameras are smaller because the, the sensor is smaller. Everything else going along with it can be smaller. A lot of people like these new micro four-thirds cameras as well, which also have larger than compact cameras but smaller than full-frame sensors uh, because they're interchangeable lenses and they're more compact and they're great. They're mirrorless too, which gives them other advantages. Um, I would say for uh, for anybody but a pro, APS-C is fine, and Nikon is, has some great cameras that use that APS-C sensor, like the 5200, uh, right. which is their newest entry level uh, DSLR. It's beautiful. So yeah, feel no, don't feel bad about. It. <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel bad about it, uh, your K5. That's a great... I, I had a K5 for a long time. I was a Pentax fan for years, and I think that's a very nice camera. You know what? Chris Marquardt's going to join us in a few minutes. Our photo guy is going to be on at 33 and a third after the hour, and he says today's photo myth will be about sensor sizes. So good. Here's a pro who can talk about that a little bit. 
Um, I happen to like uh, full frame sensor, and it's it's hard to describe to me what the difference is. It just feels uh, it's more beautiful. <laughs> but that could be all in my head, right? That could be the golden ear thing. Devin from uh, Hemet, California, has been very patient. Hi, Devin. Thanks for holding on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yes, hello. Yeah, uh, I ran across that same problem with the games you're talking about earlier. Oh, let me. Can I repeat that? Because that was off the air. You're you're obviously watching the internet stream. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> so I uh, I'm play I I I'm sad that football season's over. My Niners didn't win, but. I thought, well, it'll be fun. I can get ready for next season. I'll get Madden 13, which is a really good, I think, uh, football simulation. Play it on my PlayStation 3. And I can kind of get, you know, get in the mood. And I have a game every once in a while. And it really looks like a, I got to say, on a big screen, 65-inch TV, PS3, you, th you feel like you're watching a real football game. It's almost indistinguishable from the real thing, except you're controlling it. Except I'm playing along. I'm playing the Niners. This is fun. Score, you know, score a touchdown. I got to do the kickoff. I can't kick. I, where's the kick button? And I looked, and there's no manual in the box anymore, right? It's all on screen. So I go to the on-screen manual. Nowhere can I find how to kick. I can't play the game. So finally, I asked my son's teenage friends, hey, how do you kick in Madden 13? They said, oh, well, you got to put the pull the right button back and then push it forward. Oh, why did they tell me that? And I wonder, may, now it could be just me that I missed it, but I, I really, I searched literally for two hours to find the answer to this. Uh, maybe it's uh, that they're assuming, hey, if you're playing Madden 13, you probably paid Madden 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and you must know how to kick by now. Yeah, that's, this is all the assumptions. I came across that same problem when I bought Mass Effect 3 when it came out. It, I was looking for the instructions. To, I mean, I played the previous Mass Effect, but they changed the button to the right. They don't put there. instructions in anymore. I'm starting yeah, to yeah. sound like, I'm glad that you're, because you're a young guy, I'm sounding like an old man. Why well, don't they put instructions in here anymore? But it's not just me, is it? I, f no, I think these no, are there's so many sequels in gaming now. They just presume, hey, if you're playing Call of Duty Black Ops 2, well, you must have played some of the other Call of Duties. You know how to play. Just get in there and go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, so my question was, uh, um, I'm a personal trainer, and I am um, attempting to improve my marketing. Um, Good man. And, and I'll, I'm going to do that is get me a tablet. I never had a tablet before, and so my knowledge of tech is uh, very limited. But I now, what are you what are you going to do? You're going to use the tablet with your clients in personal training. What is your plan here? My plan is to when I go to um, uh, events that are fitness related. For example, uh, we just recently had the the Fit Expo and the LA Convention Center. Yeah, um, I didn't go to that one, but if I would have went and if I would have tablet, honestly, I would have you know taken pictures, uh, posted on my Facebook. Oh, that's um, good. I like it. You, know, you could do that with a smartphone. It doesn't have to be a tablet. It could be a smartphone, too. Okay. Do you, well, hang on a little bit, and, and I'd love to talk some more with you about this. Uh, okay. I think a smartphone might be the right choice for what, what you just described, but there are reasons to use a tablet in the gym, too. I do, and I'll talk about that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <clears throat> I probably could have looked, now that I think about it, I could have looked on uh, the Internet. How do you kick in Madden 13? But see, I was one thing in, I've learned as I've aged. Sitting in front of the TV, and I wasn't. Yeah. See, I. Yeah, Google's my friend. Here's a post on HoustonTexans.com. Seriously, the manual doesn't tell you how to kick, and I can't find anything online how to do it. It shows I have to use the R stick, but it doesn't tell me how. All my punts and kickoffs are like 30 yards. Please help. At least he's able to kick. Oh, that's good. Use the right stick. See, I should have Googled it. Pull down to start the power meter. Push up to stop. Accuracy is what direction you pushed up. <laughs> and then a lot of and then a lot of trash a lot of trash talk. <laughs> I guess it's the Houston Texans uh, board. Yeah, I could have gone here too. Madden tips and tricks. Oh, see, this is what I should have been doing. Seahawks defense is too good. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> it's realistic. Well, this is good. <laughs> oh, yeah, I could have called EA. That would have been fruitful. Uh, hi, yeah, I just bought Madden 13. How do you kick? Do you think they would have an answered that? <laughs> Uh, 
I don't know. I just thought I should be able to find this. You know, I looked at the controls. I looked at the online. Man. Thank you, John. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. It's red hot. Boiling hot. There's Chris Marquardt. He's the photo guy. Hello, but it's 15 minutes early. I know. Why'd they call you? Because they wanted to make sure everything works. I don't I'll know. I'll tell you what. Do you want to do it now? I'm totally up to it. You, sure. Did you just wake up? Uh, no, 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 no. Why did they put no, you I on? Just... I think they were confused. Uh, well, they it's you? okay. I'm, I'm here anyway. So, All right. Well, let me um, answer this does, question, does and then I'll come to you, and we can That's we fine. can get a longer segment out of you. Because <laughs> I think this full frame is a good question. Burke, Burke was is, confused. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Hang on, okay? We won't we won't bug you for a while. You can go back. You can go relax for a little bit. <laughs> uh, how can you get Kansas City to broadcast the tech guy? You know, it's a premier syndication, and premier is a clear channel, and we're usually on most clear channel stations. We're, I don't know what the number now, station count now is, but it's, you know, it's almost 200, I think. But we're not in every market, and so uh, it's just, you know, uh, you could call the station and say, Hey, please let me uh, let, take the Tech Guy show. That will help. Send them an email or a letter saying, Hey, there's this great Tech Guy show. It's on Premier Radio Networks. You need to know that. Just say Premier Radio Networks and, uh, and, and let them on. I have to say that because of iHeartRadio and because of our own stream, it's pretty easy to, you know, everywhere in the world to listen. But I want to be on broadcast radio in every town. I really do. Yeah, so just have your friends email the station or call the station. They'll, and just say, hey, th th why don't you carry the tech guy? It's such a good show. They need to uh, be, you know, get the impression that people would listen, for one thing. I think I am in Phoenix. I was in Phoenix. That's Kim Commando territory. Um, do we still have a station list at Tech Guy Labs? I'm sure we do. Yeah, stations. So, look at all the dots. <laughs> it's a lot of dots. So, we don't have good representation in South Dakota. And Texas is not great. Yeah, i got to work on East Texas in particular. Shreveport. Yeah, we're closest is uh, Louisiana. All right, Leo, if you could give me a Carbonite billboard here, it'd be great. I sure, sure. Like and also like to hide the special shoe I need to take in the snow. <laughs> People think it's so easy to kick a field goal from the 30 yard. <laughs> they forget to add It is not easy to kick in Madden 13. Well, it is, but you just have to. I don't know why I didn't look on the Internet. All of that stuff's on the Internet. I just looked it up. It's like there's a whole thing on it. Devin in Hemet, California, uh, is a personal trainer, wants to get his marketing improved. He thought it'd be fun if he goes to a fit exposed to shoot videos and put them on his website. I think that's a great idea. A really good idea, Devin. You do have a website though. That's a good start. Well, no, no, uh, I don't have a website. Of course, Facebook, um, like Facebook's good too. Um, but you know, I, the problem, the only negative on Facebook is you don't own it. So it's, it is where most of your clients probably have Facebook accounts. So it is certainly a good place to be. I would absolutely have a, you know, a Devin the Trainer page on Facebook. Um, well, but, yeah, I do. I, got a, I, I, I do got a page, but now I'm having problems. This is off topic, but now I'm having problems with Facebook wanting to charge me now. Too. Well, exactly. Well, I, so, they should yeah. still be free. They should, it's always going to be free, but you're right. They start saying, hey, you want to promote it? It's 10 bucks. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and... Good. There's no guarantee they're not going to come along and shut you down. It's their, it's them, not you. So it's always good, in addition to having a Facebook page, to have a web page. It doesn't have to cost you anything. You can do it on Tumblr, uh, T-U-M-B-L-R.com. You could do it on WordPress.com. Uh, you can even, if you want to get fancy, pay for a page at Squarespace. Our sponsor, Squarespace, does hosting. And that will give you some more features and make sure you control it even more. It's everybody, every business should have their own a page they own in addition to a presence on Twitter and on Facebook. And what you want to put on all three places, and this is nice because you don't you can duplicate effort. You don't have to have separate stuff on all three places. But you want to put on all three places is stuff that's useful to your clients. It can't just be, hey, hire me, I'm great. 
hey, look at my abs, I'm ripped. It's got to be stuff that's useful to them. Like, you know, five, and, and for some reason people love this, they love lists. Five things you have to know for, to get great abs. Five diet tips everybody should know. Uh, ten ways to keep your New Year's resolution. Stuff like that. They love that. And I think it's a great idea if you go to the Fit Expo to shoot video and put that up there, too. Say, well, hey. Yeah, and I also want them to, you know, obviously you know, shoot videos of my clients and then shoot videos of me. But, but I mentioned about the smartphone. See, I don't have a smartphone. I'm, I'm in the Stone Age because <laughs> of technology. Yeah, so this would be the easiest way to start. You're going to re replace your existing cell phone with an iPhone or an Android phone, they have great video capabilities, better than the tablets. They're much smaller, more compact, right? So you always have it with you. And uh, because they're always online, it's easy to post. You can post right to Facebook or right to your Tumble uh, immediately. You would, suggest, you would suggest getting a smartphone over a tablet then? Yeah, I would. A tablet's nice for you because it's a bigger screen, so if you're working with it, you can do more stuff. But in terms of portability and quality, a, a smartphone would be better. Who's your Who's your phone company? Oh, well, right now, um, it's Verizon, but it's I have in mind. I'm, I'm on my dad's plan. He's, uh, I have an extra phone, so eventually I need to get my own phone. Yeah, Verizon has an iPhone uh, that's quite good. I think for a lot of people, that's a great start. And, by the way, there's some really good fitness apps on iOS. Uh, that's why I take sometimes take my tablet. To, I take my tablet to the gym for a few things. Where, you know, I listen to audiobooks or I play games while I'm on the Stairmaster because that's boring. And they have a nice little easel right there on the elliptical. And I could just do it, and 30 minutes later, it's, uh, I don't for, even didn't even know what was happening. But I also use uh, – there's a number of wonderful fitness apps that you can – that you as a trainer – could give could say to your clients here you know install this fitness app and I'm going to put your routine in the fitness app and the fitness app will then keep track of their reps uh, when they did it you know and can and can even have videos showing them how to do it it's very I I'm I'm a big fan I have a number of one of of uh, uh, apps there's fitness HD um, there's probably my one of my favorites there's fitness trainer and these allow you to keep track of uh, your uh, your uh, your exercise routine as you work, and you can even tie it into your uh, your Facebook. You could probably have them share it over to your Facebook. Look how well my clients are doing. That kind of thing. Do you get the idea that the whole thing is kind of it, 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 it all works together as a way of helping your clients do a better job? As long as you focus on that, and then Devin is just you know the facilitator. I think I think you're on the right track. Does that make sense, okay. Devin? Well, yeah, yeah. Just um... you can get you can get a tablet if you want, uh, and and uh, you know certainly um, uh, the iPad, iPad Mini, would be a great choice. Um, be careful on some of the Android tablets. A lot of them don't have rear-facing cameras, so uh, you can't shoot video very well with them. I think the iPhone actually has a better camera than the iPad. That is strange. But then again, I never had a. I'm not in that world, so. I, never I think it's know. time. Get in that world, Devin. Oh, yeah, it is time. For think sure. of it as a business expense. In fact, it is deductible as a business expense. Well, and, yeah. Yeah, and 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 use it that way. It's, it really is a marketing tool. I think you've already got the Facebook page. Is you've got ninety percent of what you need. Just have that content be other places besides Facebook. Tumblr probably the easiest for you. There's a Tumblr app on iOS. Makes it very easy to post to Tumblr to cross post to Facebook. You should probably have an Instagram account so you could take pictures. Well, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I need to get that. And what about Skype? You can you that? Can you get that on the uh, on yeah. your cell phone? Yeah, too? you can use Skype on the on the smartphone as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Instagram is hot right now. This is a Facebook. Yeah. And all your friends are using Instagram. I follow the 49ers on Instagram. It's fun to see what they're doing in the off season. This is a great marketing tool. And it's simple. You take a picture, you post it. Mm -hmm. And people follow you. It's kind of like Twitter with pictures. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of great things out there that uh, you can use uh, to help market yourself. And you're very smart to start to start doing that. I think that's the way to do it. What kind of, what kind of training do you do? Do you, do you do weights? What do you do? Uh, for right now, uh, it's just um, I don't have any special, specializations yet. But for right now, you know, just getting anyone that uh, has a sedentary lifestyle into fitness. That's the way um, to do it. Um, Obviously, um, if you want to advance your fitness, I can help you out there. But I am still uh, in 
increase in my knowledge and my ability. Sure. It never stops, does it, Devin? Yeah. No, it doesn't. Well, if you want to be great, it never stops. If you want to stay, you know, mediocre or not that good. No, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But if you want to be the best, I could tell you want to be the best. Oh, yeah, for sure I do. The so. learning never stops in any field. Mm-hmm. Except mine. I'm really done. Oh. <laughs> just kidding. Hey, thanks, Devin. It's good to talk to you. We've got guess who we've got on the line. We're going to talk to him in just a moment. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, is just champing at the bit because he wants to dispel that myth on sensor size. Chris, is a bigger sensor better? Hey, how's it going? Hey, Chris Marquardt, the <laughs> photo guy. We're going to start a little early with you, uh, awesome. just because I wanted um, to follow up on that last call a couple of calls ago. It gave me it gave me a big smile. I heard that. I was like, yes, that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. That was so, really you planned on that before. Yes, I did plan on that before. Oh, it's not. Like, a, it's yeah, a, what a perfect coincidence. Fit, perfect all fit. right. Yeah. So big bigger sensor. Um, uh, first of all, the size of the sensor is relative. You know, if you look at the full what we call full frame format, you, yeah. you have a full frame camera, right? I do. I have that five D. I love it. And to me, okay, I see so, something different. It does look different. But hang on. We're going to talk to you. Chris Marquardt, the right. photo guy, coming up. ChrisMarquardt.com. More of your calls, too, at 8888-ASK-LEO. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <clears throat> Red Hot Chili Peppers. Huh? Pipers. Pi Red Hot Chili Pipers. Who's that? Is that a band? Never heard of them. <laughs> Is it bagpipes? Red Hot Chili Peppers with bagpipes. Oh, fly. <laughs> I love bagpipes. My college roommate played bagpipes. We made him stand way out in the... This is good. The Red Hot Chili Pipes. How do you know about them? You're just in the... Or do you play the pipes? I don't... No, I don't actually... I play the... Play the chanter a little bit. I never learned... That's the little... Uh, the read... Uh, the real thing. Yeah. I like that sound. I like drones. I don't know why. Sitar. I like that drone sound. And we had Roger McGuinn on talking about his... Uh, he designed a seven string, and the seven string is almost a drone string which gives you that almost that 12-string feel on a six-string guitar. It's really beautiful. I just like that sound. Tom Finn says, Leo is a Scot. Believe me, this is not good. <laughs> it's not good. It's great. <laughs> it's crap. If it's not Scottish, it's crap. Uh, so how are you doing, Chris? I'm doing good. I'm... I just had a two-day workshop here in Hanover. Oh yeah, what yeah. was it on? Um, the the human, the the, the 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 people in front of the camera, pretty much. Yeah, you're, shape, you, this is form, becoming one of your things, isn't it? It this is. People, people is just the yeah. thing that I'm about. Yeah. When I when I went it when when I went to Japan, wildlife is awesome. But what I was looking for was the human kind of relation in everything. And I I tried to pick like these the snow monkeys and the yeah. the cranes and things were just. They're Very easy. Human sometimes. They're easy to do, and so is the so is architectural or landscape photography. I find human photography very challenging because I'm shy. It is. They, they 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 complain and they run away from you. They're shy, and you yeah, disrupt buildings. as soon as you start taking pictures of people. You disrupt the natural feel. Buildings and yet, to me, that. the pictures that I am most interested in, I always stare at the ones I'm, I really gravitate to. Is all, all of humans. I I just that's because I like humans. Well, yeah. Have you have you heard of uh, Vivian Meyer? You probably heard of oh, her. She was a photographer. I loved in the 60s. her stuff. I love her. Well, they are they're now almost done with making that movie about her. Oh, or I that can't documentary. wait. And the trailer is out at this point. It just came out a day ago. So the story of her is very um, interesting. She was a nanny, and she didn't have a great camera. She had a little brand. I don't. It was probably okay. It was probably a Leica or something. And she would just on her time off, she'd go shoot pictures, and she put them in a box. She didn't show them to anybody. She never had a show. She never did anything with them. And then um, she died. And a guy bought the where ha the storage locker that had her pictures. And he started going through them. He said, these are my God. These are amazing. Street photography. Amazing street photography. If you go to, go uh, to YouTube, um, the trailer is called Finding Vivian Meyer. 
Vivian M A I E R. What a story! I cannot wait. And her, I love. She, you know, I love street photography. And it was it was people photography. She was all about people oh, photography, yeah. and their, oh, yeah. her photos are just so they're breathtakingly good. Let's play it a little bit. Of it. The auction house is across the street from my home. I found this box loaded with negatives. I won it for I think it was three hundred and eighty dollars. The history of street photography is currently being rewritten. Vivian May. Oh, Vivian I can't Mayer. wait to Vivian see Mayer? this. Exhibitions in New York. Oh my God, I'm getting chills. Just the story is incredible. But then you look at her pictures, and she documented 1950s New York. It's stunning. Here we go. And you have to. <laughs> it's another one of those weird mashups that my musical director Kyle Bennett has become so famous for. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And it's time for the photo guy. Chris Marquardt is here. This portion of the Tech Guys show brought to you. Who's it brought to you by, Kyle Benham? You tell me. Stamps.com. Stamps.com. You don't have to go to the post office to buy stamps. You know, the stamps are going up. Prices are going up in the U.S. No, in the U.S., we've got a better choice. It's called Stamps.com. You buy and print your own legal U.S. postage from your computer and your printer. It's such a great service. If you're a postal professional, if you do mailing for business, you got to have stamps.com. Use uh, my name, Leo, for a no-risk trial. It includes $55 free postage, a scale, and a month of stamps.com. Stamps.com. Use my name, Leo. Click that uh, microphone in the corner there. Chris Marquardt is from Tübingen, Germany. And I was hoping for a bagpipe version of Kodak Rome. Oh, there's, oh <laughs> you know, there's got to be it. Kyle Benham, get to work on that. That, uh, that would be the perfect theme song for Chris. Chris joins us I like every week. I too. <laughs> I, you know, there's something about them. Uh, in person, they're not so great. But at a distance, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> My college roommate used to play the bagpipes, and we used to say, oh, get wow. out of here. Go, go, go. Go play out in the field somewhere. And uh, so he would go far away, and you still hear heard him, which was beautiful. There's something mournful about a, dis is, yeah, a distant bagpipe. It is, yeah. <laughs> but but we were talking about sensor sizes. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Now, um, our caller had a, a very nice DSLR, the the Pentax K5, 16 megapixels, yeah. and he thought, I you know this is only an APS-C sensor, a smaller sensor. I should try a full frame sensor. So he uh, rented a, Nik a Nikon D3, which is a very nice, big camera, a lot bigger than the Pentax. And he said, the, you know, I blew them up. I made prints. I didn't notice much difference. Yeah. Is that I mean, true? The, 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 well, yes and no. The, what, the thing is, what is full frame? You know, there's 35 millimeter uh, format that has been standardized back in 1909 or something. It's over 100 years old, that format of the full frame. But that's so a film format. a bit of a standard. That's a film yeah. format. And when we, when we say full frame uh, on a DSLR, that's pretty much the same thing. That's that's the 24 by, uh, by 36 millimeters. That's the official size for that. And you can still buy new cameras that use that. I mean, I mean the film format and film cameras. Nikon still has two film cameras out there wow. that are film SLRs. Um, and... The problem with that is that making digital sensors at that size is kind of expensive. Right. The s smaller ones are much cheaper to do. Um, so that kind of used to be the norm. The small sensors, the first digital sensors were very small. And even if you if you if you open up if if you would open up your iPhone and and look at the sensor, that's pretty much smaller than the size of your your the fingernail on your pinky. So. A lot of sensors are very small, and there, there's a bit of a price you pay with a smaller sensor. Smaller pixels have a bit of a disadvantage when it comes to basic things like noise, for example. Like if you want to shoot in low light and you, you try to cram the same amount of pixels, let's say 18 megapixels, and you try to cram that into, the same, into a smaller space on a smaller sensor, then you end up with smaller pixels, and they are a bit more noisy. So that's, that's just a physical fact that happens there. But... Those smaller sensors also have one big advantage, and that is the longer apparent focal length. So a telephoto lens, for example, um, you let, let's say a 1.5 crop. APS-C is like a 1.5 crop, roughly. So you would, instead of the 200 millimeter lens that you put on there, it would act as if it was a 300 millimeter lens. So if you have a 200 millimeter lens and you put it on 
a full frame camera like the 5D, it's 200 then millimeters. It is, it is 200 but millimeters. But if you put it yeah. on the K5, the Pentax, it's 50% more. It's 300 millimeters. Yes, times 1.5. I think that's that's the crop factor. It could be 1.6. I think it's 1.6, but, it's but anyway, it's, yeah, it's in that area. So a, a, a 600 millimeter lens would be like a, almost like a 900 millimeter telescope almost. Yeah. So that that gets really interesting for those photographers who want who, who need longer focal lengths. Now, if you want a wider focal length, though, that's a problem, isn't it? Because it's hard to get an eight millimeter lens. That is where full frame actually is really ha at an advantage. Right. Full frame is better at wide angle. But sports photographers uh, who shoot lots of long pictures with big lenses, um, you can work with smaller lenses and still get a bigger magnification. Right. Same is true for wildlife photographers. Um, you do have an advantage there. And today's sensors, even the crop sensors, the APS-C sensors, um, they're actually really good. Um, I think they're very good. I think the crop sensors... Yes, I mean, my X100, my Fuji film, and and it, and by the way, because it's a smaller sensor, the cameras are more compact. And for street photography, for instance, the the Fuji film is great because it just looks like a smaller camera; it doesn't look like a big professional rig. Oh, I, I've I've just recently uh, played with the Olympus OMD. It looks like an beautiful. old analog SLR. Love it's it. a beautiful camera. Yeah. It look, looks very retro. Yeah. But it it is it is a camera that has just great image quality. Now that's a Micro Four Thirds, but. Um, which is what, even it, a bit smaller. Micro Four Thirds but, is smaller than APS-C, isn't it? Yes, but you still get awesome image quality out of even this size sensor. So I would I would not hesitate using those in a professional environment if that's what I got. Very good to know. But you know, a lot of times people, and this is always the case, they focus on numbers. I got to have the <laughs> fastest megahertz. I got to have the largest frame. And and as you know, it's the photographer, not the camera. Yes, mostly the photographer, but some, sometimes sensor size obviously can be uh, can be. Uh, well, if you're a great photographer, it'll be even better, right? I have I have played with bigger sizes, not digitally, but analog, like four by five negatives. Oh, they're beautiful. Um, there is something to be said about that size of negative, but it's not a requirement to work professionally. Absolutely and counting not. megapixels is really dumb because, uh, well, there's for instance a Nokia phone, the Pure View, that has 41 megapixels. <laughs> That yes. doesn't mean it's 41 times better. It means, in fact, it's not. So, and, and it's a, it's a whole chain of things. You need a, you, it, with these kind of sensors, you will then need lenses that can resolve that amount of pixels yeah. because a lens only has is so good. So, so the image that ends up on the sensor needs a good quality, and and you need more expensive lenses. So, it's really if if you get these many megapixels, you will then have to invest in more glass and bigger computers, and you'll need more processing power. And it's a, it's really a big chain of things that happens when yeah. when you start going this way. And then there's the other discussion about sensors itself. There there's the standard CMOS uh, sensor which most cameras now use, most high-end cameras use. There's the right. Foveon sensor, which Sigma is using, which is a completely different design and has some yes. benefits. And there's uh, CCDs. I don't know if any uh, still cameras uh, use CCDs anymore. Uh, they're still there, and, and CCDs do have advantages, and CMOS does have advantages, and but they both have disadvantages. And then if you look at the Foveon, um, this would actually be my favorite because it doesn't use the what's called a Bayer pattern. It doesn't have to do interpolation on the image. You get uh, typically get a bit sharper images. You don't don't have. Do you use uh, a Foveon the artifacts? Uh, camera? No, I don't because because they don't really. They aren't really good at low light. You uh, uh, at higher ISOs, they tend to be very noisy. So you see, I like again, I like the ability. But the, my main reason for using full frame is I want to have a very wide open lens, uh, f one two lens, and I want to have a lot of light because I don't like the flash. I don't. I just want to. I just want to. Although, oh, and you and you do get a bigger picture when you look through the viewfinder on a yeah, full frame camera. Yeah. You get you get a much bigger picture that yeah. is much brighter usually than on a crop camera. But still, it. I use I, I know professionals who use crop cameras and they're they're really good with them and they actually help them do their job better. See, there you go. Hey, uh, we have a photo assignment uh, ongoing. A new one? Did we start a new one last week? No, we don't. We didn't. We go. We're going to review the current one, which is resolution, and we'll review that next week. Next and then week. I'll give you a new assignment. Last chance. Then, if you want to uh, participate, here's how it works. You take a picture. You got to be new pictures, illustrating. The concept, the word resolution, whatever that means to you. It could be New Year's resolution. It could be camera resolution. I don't know. Whatever that means to you. Um, and tag it with the word resolution and upload it to Flickr. Make sure you submit it to our Tech Guy group. And uh, and you have to be a member of Flickr and the Tech Guy group, but that's all free. If Once you get it up there, uh, 
Chris is going to review all the images with that tag of resolution and pick three to talk about next week. You can find out more at chrismarquart.com or visit our website, techguylabs.com. For Chris's workshops, discoverthetopfloor.com. Thank you, Chris. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Yay. Yeah, I like low light. I don't want it. But uh, now, then I've been trying to practice dragging the shutter. And I got it because you had a great image last time for, with the dra shutter drag. You, you had, we, we had, a, we had you know, a, a I couple love Epson and of photographers in Japan who were both shooting with the uh, with the Olympus OMD, and they had uh, oh, old camera. manual focus, wow, Rockhor Minolta, Minolta Rockhor lenses on wow. with an adapter, and it was just beautiful. The, the, what what you got with these things? So there are so many exciting combinations, especially with Micro Four Thirds and smaller cameras, where you can now adapt older manual lenses to them. I got an OM one a, uh, 50 millimeter lens for my uh, Micro Four Thirds because I got a little adapter. Beautiful. Yeah, it's really fun beautiful. to do that. Yeah. Ah, so I think I think that's very exciting the way you can now kind of mix and match things with these smaller sensor cameras. So the smaller sensor is really, uh, really good. And if you use a, a Canon 7D, hey, that so that's professional material. And no matter what they tell that's you, it's a professional camera. That's a great camera. camera. That's what you use. Yeah, it's a great. Peter uses it. That's a great camera. Yeah. What I'm trying to think, I want the X100 is too finicky. I need something roughly that size for traveling with a good size well, sensor. Have a look a at the OMD. Uh, is that a have micro a look four at thirds? The OMD. Um, I think it's a micro four thirds. Yeah. Have a look at it. It's fast. It's I good. played with um, it. We had it for review, and I was impressed by it. Yeah, I've, I'm, I'm, I played with it for a while. Um, yeah, it's a micro in Japan, and it was, I was, I was really impressed with it. Yes. It is a little. It, I, I used to have an OM one, which I loved. Well, then that might be the camera for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's about a thousand. Give it a try. Bucks. It's very, it's very customizable. You can, you can pretty much do have several buttons and, and dials and things that you can customize. Do you like? And it comes in black and silver. What should I get? Silver would put and people, would fool people because they think I was an, a, a tourist. On first look, it really looks like an old analog SLR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless you turn, uh, unless you turn it around, then it, you have a display and everything. And it's fast. I mean, the display says everything is really fast and 16 megapixel, easy to work. Live MOS sensor, TruePic VI. Yeah. 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 Well, what does it come? <laughs> what does it come with a lens? No. So, what I lens did they have that you liked? This is the 45 mm Well, they, they had they F1 had they A. used they used old. Oh, that's right. They used a mount. So. Yeah. That's the nice thing about so micro four adapter, thirds, which ma which makes it bul more bulky, it makes it bigger, obviously. I don't know. I need don't need to buy lenses because I have my micro four thirds lenses from my um, well then, my pen tech, my, uh, my then... uh, EP one, my pen, yeah. which I don't like. I didn't like the pen that much because it was a, it, it just didn't the focus was really slow. And I had the first pen, so I could just take reuse those lenses. I have the Pancake Seventeen. I should be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. and then I have well, the adapter. Give it, give it a and try, and if, if it doesn't work for you, return it. Ah, tough choices. I hate buying another camera because I already have so many that I don't use. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you should, you I should. should sell the old ones is what I should do. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have a whole thing full of cameras. and. Yeah, I love them. And I love my Nike, my uh, Canon uh, 5D. I'm not going to get a Mark III. I love the 5D. Yeah, and I'm if still I have, a Mark II. Yeah, if I have, because I have an 85.1. Point two and a fifty-one point two, and if I want to shoot portraits and stuff, and I'm in a studio environment, I, that's great. But I'm I yes. really want a street photography camera. Well, then the one of these the Micro Four Thirds might be just the just the ticket. Tough choices. He uses uh, TVZ Gun uses his old FM his Nikon FM lenses on his D90. That's nice. I had an FM. I loved that too. That was a great camera, film camera, the manual. Nikon. Well, I want I want a digital version of the Minolta X700. That was my camera for for many many years. Yeah. X700, beautiful, simple to use, very precise. You know, it's funny. I it, I like in New Orleans, I didn't even bring a camera. I just used my phone. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was fine. Um, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> I, I, yeah. I I do that too, but the the stuff that I shoot with I the know. phone. You don't get. You miss the good shots. All right, I got to run. Thanks, Chris. All right. See care. ya. Bye-bye. Leo Laporte. The tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Isn't it fun to talk about tech? Really, seriously. This is its one of the best beats you can have as a journalist because no one dies. 
You know, I mean, it's not you're not talking about uh, murder and mayhem and war and famine. You're talking about interesting stuff. And yet it's not trivial. It's, it's the toy store, but it's not just toys. I mean, this stuff is it's changing everything. So it's, I just I love this stuff. I hope you're enjoying it, too. 8888 Ask Leo, the uh, website techguylabs.com. Carlton is in Knoxville, Tennessee. Hi, Carlton. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. I have a question about a Galaxy Note 10.1. Okay. And, and what I'm looking for is a easy and fast way to take a full page of handwritten notes and emailing them. You could email a much smaller version pretty quickly, but if you have a full page of notes, like eight and a half by 11 sheets, it seems like you have to go through several steps to get well, that's interesting. email. What are you using uh, for the notes app? I just S notes. Just the built-in S notes. And does, does the, this one has a stylus, does it not? Or, or does it? Yes. And it the does. stylus is going to, if Apple doesn't do something, uh, it looks like the stylus is going to take the business away for business and student use of these apps. Yeah, I mean, I have a Galaxy Note phone, the Note 2, which also has the S Pen, and uh, and I love it. Uh, I never use the pen, but I have, but I like the – I could see if you were somebody who was really into handwriting. You can do handwriting much faster than you could type or dictate. Uh, if you like to sketch or draw little diagrams, nothing better. Um, right. So really what we want to do is find a better Note, a better note application for Android – uh, that uses the S Pen, and I, I don't, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, so it seems like Samsung's the only one making these uh, note-taking applications. Um, right. I do use Evernote. Have you tried Evernote? I've tried it, but I haven't tried it on that. I've had every Apple product since 85, and this is the first um, non-Apple device I've ever bought. Are you happy with it? Yeah, except for I'd like to be able to to email uh, full page notes. full page notes. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I love it. Otherwise, I mean, it's it's fine. I I'm, I'll keep my iPads as well, but I but I definitely like it for the note taking and for the stylus. Right. And I'm hoping that Apple will come up with some kind of stylus that'll compete with with the one that's uh, used on that. No. Well, the good news is that Samsung has released what they call an SDK, a software development kit for the S Pen. So, in theory, uh, app developers can use the S, can write note-taking apps with the S Pen in mind. Um, I don't know what is out there. Um, so, let me do some research. Maybe somebody in the chat room will have some suggestions. Uh, what we're looking for is a full-screen note-taking app. Imagine a yellow pad that fills the 10-inch tablet. He can fill it up with notes and then email it out directly. That's correct. Uh, That's correct. I'm just going to take a look and see if we can find something. Just keep listening, will you? And we'll, I'm, I'm making a note that that's a, an assignment. And I'll do it. I've been listening for 100 miles now. <laughs> we made you. We made you listen. Right. Um, right. I Appreciate it. Hey, I'm so glad you, you called. Thank you. Keep listening. Another 100 miles, we should have your answer. Somebody's saying Antinote. Let me look that up for Android. Antinote. It's an interesting name. Antipaper Notes. Ooh, it's pretty. Handwriting at its best. Simple and elegant handwriting application. No longer limited by light text fields and pesky keyboard. Now you're in charge. Just take your finger or stylus and write down whatever you want, however you want. Take notes. Take your notebooks with you. Zoom in, email a beautiful handwritten page. There it is. All right, I'm going to install this, and uh, I'll let you know. It sure does look pretty. Uh, it looks like you can do more than just a plain text. You can also draw and so forth. Uh, it's, it's called Anti-Paper Notes by Hubert O.G., Anti and it's made for tablets. It's designed for tablets, so it would use that. I will install it right now, and I'll let you know. That looks uh, very nice. And, of course, with anything you do, uh, you can always, as long as you can save that out, you can attach it to an email and send it out. But, um, yeah, there's a penultimate they're mentioning in the chat room, which is a great iOS app. Love that. Anti-Notes is apparently free. I just installed it on my uh, Galaxy Note. So I'll just... Uh, Keep, keep listening, Carlton, but there's at least one choice for you that looks quite beautiful.
anti-paper notes. Naomi in Denver. Hello, Naomi. Leo Laporte, the Hi, tech Leo. guy. I have a problem or two. My uh, soon-to-be nephew uh, had his hard drive in his laptop go berserk on him, and it has some of the pictures they had when they were going together, etc. And he wanted to put them on for their wedding reception and things, but I can't. He couldn't get his. Uh, laptop to recognize so we took the drive out of the a laptop and i've got it and tried to put it on my desktop but my desktop won't recognize it he gave me this thing called apricorns sat a wire uh 3.1 and i was wondering do i have to install uh software to have it recognize that <sighs> i don't think so i'm a little worried that the hard drive's dead. I mean, it doesn't. Sh it, he can't access it from his computer. Is that right? Yeah. And, and then, have, and then he gave it to you in a um, external USB case. Is that how you got it? Uh. How did how, he just yeah, gave yeah, you a drive? What did he? It's in a case, he right? Gave me the drive. I just, have a drive and the Apricorn Sat I Sat A wire, and I do have Spinrite. If I can. Go oh to wow! Try. I'm impressed. Naomi, oh. you're a geek. Okay. It says, it says sucker on my forehead. <laughs> no, no. Spinrite's the best. So the Apricorn is uh, basically designed to take a bare drive, as he took out of his computer, and turn it into a USB drive just for temporary purposes. Uh-huh. So you plugged it in. You plugged it in your computer, and it doesn't pop up. Correct. Uh, I, have I think he's got a dead drive. I think that drive's completely dead. <sighs> He also gave me a CD with it, and it's called the Upgrade Suite. It comes with that. Uh, app you don't need it. that. I, I do see it comes with some software, but you, but the issue, I mean, you should just be able to see the drive. If the drive's working, what that software is cloning software, which would be great if you could see the drive, no problem. You plug the drive in, you'd run the cloning software, and you'd be able to give him his drive back, but you can't see the drive, right? I can hear the drive. Oh, good. Okay, so this is good. So you hear the drive spinning up. I can hear it, yeah. Yeah. And you feel it, you know. When you you feel it. Mm, you don't shake it, by the way. <laughs> uh, oh, what a feeling. <laughs> oh, what a feeling. Yeah. No, Naomi, I, I think it's time to bring it to a shop because if you can't see it, you can't run spin right on it, which you'd like to. It it sounds like it's a dead, uh, dead drive. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All right, let's watch this uh, Vivian Meyer uh, video while I slurp. IT, it could be the worst job in the world. It could be the best job in the world. I want to slurp. I'm dying to see this movie now. The auction house is across the street from my home. I found this box loaded with negatives. I won it for, I think it was $380. The history of street photography is currently being rewritten. Vivian Meyer. Vivian Meyer. Vivian Meyer. Exhibitions in New York and L.A. and London and Chicago. We've had more interest in this work than perhaps any other photographer. There's one particular that I bought, which I love. The composition is slightly off to me, and I think that's why I like it. She's Vivian was a very private woman. She was so awesomely neat. She was not an open person. She was a closed person. Vivian was my nanny. Yeah, she was our nanny. He certainly had no idea that she took photographs. She lived on the third floor in our attic. This was the forbidden zone. One of the first things she asked me for was please to put in a lock. She said, don't ever open the door. <laughs> they didn't know there was this creative person there. She took so many photos. Around 100,000 negatives, 700 rolls of undeveloped color film, 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter movies. She would take us and we would just walk in the worst parts of town. I think she liked that. You know, maybe we just didn't understand her. Uh, no. What would you say to Vivian now? What drove you to hide yourself away? I did her, why the f***? <laughs> Why the f*** didn't you ever show me all the stuff you did? Brilliant I thought I was a friend of yours. 
in what death, I? she is getting the fame that she never had in life. I'm uncovering an artist. If I'm leaving this giant boulder unturned, it would be a mistake. Course, it's so fortuitous that he bought her. She would never bought her stuff. What if he hadn't bought it? She had some compulsive behaviors. She was a pack rat. I yeah. asked her what she did. Order. Her answer was, I'm sort of a spy. We would say, what's your name? Miss V. Smith. Hmm. There's a piece of the puzzle missing. Look what at she these. was photographing. They're she incredible. Was just how close you can come into somebody's space. That tells me a lot about her. She could get them to accommodate her by being themselves. Look at that. Oh my God. She could generate this moment, and then she's gone. Can't wait to see this. Is there anything that you wish was done differently then? Sure, I wish I would have found those negatives yeah. instead of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's lucky somebody found them. What if they stayed in that uh, storage locker or they were thrown out? I mean, they could be lost forever. 100,000 negatives. And fortunately, somebody who knew something about photography bought them. I mean, it's just chance. Unbelievable. Oh, and man, they're good. I mean, I you know, if you you can go on the net and there's an official website. He's slowly posting them. Um, what a what a story. Yeah, Vivian Meyer prints. You can buy prints. Oh no, she died. That's why he got the uh, storage locker. She never had a show. No one ever knew while she was alive. Um, it was just, uh, you know, I mean, brilliant photographer. And now look, there's films, there's books, there's galleries. I don't even know, is there an estate? I don't even know if there's an estate. I think it's just some guy lucked out. Maybe it's all a hoax. You can't fake these though, because they're from, they're old. You know, they're, um, this is New York in the 50s. You couldn't shoot them now. Unbelievable stuff. And yeah, there's obviously millions of dollars. I don't know who's going to get it. She, maybe she has an estate. I don't know. He bought them. They're his. She defaulted uh, on, on the storage space, I guess. Chicago owns them? Oh, it's Chicago? I thought it was New York. It's Chicago? All right. Wasn't it? Actually, it was, wasn't it New York and Chicago? This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We'll begin it. It feels like New York to me, but it did look like the L, didn't it? Uh, yeah, Chicago. I guess any any city in that era is going to look. Here's pictures of her, I guess. Hmm. And probably because she seems so so unassuming, right? With her little camera, that she could get away with it. Like, I think that's kind of the key on street photography. Here's the 40s. That's not Chicago. That's got to be Europe, right? This must be when she was a young girl in Germany. Post-war Germany. Amazing. She's got really got an eye, you know? She's, that's the thing. That's You see what immediately the, the composition is just incredible. Yeah, it was a role. It looked like a role, right? You take it like that. I I don't know who owns it. This is Premier Channel Seven. Leo Laporte. It's an amazing story. I mean, she's been discovered. <laughs> she's long gone. <laughs> really amazing. Yeah, you don't need the Microsoft uh, stuff. I don't know if it gets in the 
away. You know, it's generally considered a bad idea to run too many viruses, but maybe this not. This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Network. You're tuned to Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte. Oh, that's interesting. So the guy who found these, John Maloof, from was writing Radio a book Networks. for the he was a president of the Historical Society of Chicago's Northwest Side, and he was writing a book about it, and he was looking for vintage photos of the neighborhood. So that's when he visited the auction house and found the her negatives. He couldn't look through the contents, so he took a gamble and purchased the box of negatives for 400 bucks. You were tuned to premiere. So he was looking for. It's interesting. So he knew something about photography. And he was looking for pictures. Six minutes past the hour. From premiere. After, oh, well, maybe not. After he and his co-author looked through the negatives, they found nothing relevant for the project, so he put them in a closet. And then later, he started looking at them again. Wow. He didn't know right away. It's interesting. He really didn't know. It took him a long time to figure out what he had. But then he started going around and collecting other negatives, so he realized. Interesting. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy, hour number three of the Tech Guy program. If you have a question about technology, I think we can find the answer for you. Another, um, uh, we, were, we were talking to a caller before the break. He was looking for pen apps for um, uh, his Galaxy Note tablet. And we found another one as well. Oh, and now I've, have I lost the name of it? I think I did. Oh, that's too bad. Um, but we found one more. Although I have to say, the, the the I've been playing a little bit with the first that I mentioned, and uh, and I have to say I really like that. What was the name of the uh, other one, chat room? You found it, and I'm just uh, we we have the uh, anti note, which I do like quite a bit. What was the name of the other one? Well, well it'll come back to me, probably because the chat room will remember it. Pen Supremacy, that's it. It's a clone of the penultimate app, which I mentioned is the best on iOS. Pen supremacy thank you to the uh, chat room as always and to the gray area in the chat room he says that's a recommendation from androidcommunity.com which is a good place to go good forum to go for android information problem with pen supremacy it's a buck 49 it's not free <laughs> but it, it looks good and it, it does have that capability that he was looking for of taking a full page of uh, of notes and then emailing them off you can convert them to PDF and email them or share them with other apps like Evernote, which I like, or Facebook, Picasa, Pixay. They become basically a, an image in your gallery. So that looks like another good choice. Pen Supremacy for tablets. That's by AppKing, A-P-K-I-N-G. A couple of good choices. Phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO. If I can't answer it, as you can see, our chat room is very adept. They could probably, they could probably find the answer to almost any question. Greg in Hanford, California. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Greg. Hi, Leo. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you. Feeling much better. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Boy, that there's a nasty cold going around. I had it about a month ago, and it took me about two weeks. Yeah. It's a two-week cold. It lingers. Yeah. yeah. I was caught up in my sinuses. That's it. That's uh, the one. You must have given it to me. Yeah. <laughs> What can I? What can I do? All the all the way from uh, Hanford, Hanford, California. What can I do for you? Okay, uh, I had a question. Uh, long time listener too, by the way, and, and thanks for doing the great job that you've done all these years. Uh, you know, I can't. You shouldn't thank me. It's I am the luckiest person in the world. Yeah, I know you. are. <laughs> I'm so lucky to be able to do this. So hey, you're welcome. But pardon me. Whatever happened to Cliff Stahl? I used to watch him on your tech Oh, I love Cliff. He's an astronomer at the uh -huh. University of California at Berkeley. And as far as I know, he's still there. But he wrote a couple of really interesting 
uh, books. Uh, the first was called The Cuckoo's Egg. talks about him tracking down a hacker who got onto his system and getting him arrested. It's a fascinating story of the kind of going after a hacker from the other uh, side. The hacker was Marcus Hess, and the book came out in uh, the late 80s. Um, he was also kind of an anti-technologist, as you remember from Call for Help. Right. He used to come on and say, get outside, breathe some fresh air, yeah. get out, get away from the computer. And right. he wrote a book in the 90s called Silicon Snake Oil, which was you know, basically saying it was all baloney. Uh -huh. um, he, uh, he makes glass Klein bottles, according to well, Wikipedia, which is a, a, a very interesting kind of a Mobius strip uh, in three dimensions. Teach, uh, taught eighth grade physics, uh, and uh, and is a ham K seven T A. So maybe you can get him on the ham bands. Um, I'm not a hammer. Yeah, I you know I, as far as I know, I, it, last I talked to him, he was uh, he was teaching uh, astronomy, but I don't know if he's uh, still doing that. Really interesting yeah. guy. I really enjoyed his show. I did too, and I, I thought it was a good antidote. You know, we reason we did him on Call for Help, the old TV show on the. Tech TV is because, you know, here we are, you know, singing the praises of technology, and it's good to also hear the other side. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I well, still love technology. He, he didn't convince me, but. <laughs> <laughs> one of the points that he had years ago, and I, I thought it was a good point, was that uh, uh, these gadgets and uh, computers and things, they, they get old so quick. It's a huge point, and, and, and it's worse than ever. They're built for obsolescence. The iPad is virtually unrecyclable. I know. And it's really designed to last a year or two before you buy a new one. You can't replace the battery. So once the battery wears out, it only has 500 charge cycles, something like that. you, you got to buy a new one. Oh. iPhone, all smartphones, too, to some degree, are based on uh, obsolescence, and it's a shame. It's really a – I think it's a – the truth is a modern computer is so fast it probably uh, and and the parts wear so little it could last a long long time but uh, then you wouldn't the companies wouldn't be able to rake in the big profits they're raking in right yeah it kind of segues into my question i had a i, I bought the first ipad i was quite excited about it like a lot of people um, I've since given that to my grandchildren so they can play games on it strictly and, and i bet they love it they love it. It's great for them. Um, I had to jailbreak that iPad, and, and uh, that's the question I had about. I like to download videos and watch them uh, without a Wi-Fi connection. You can store them on the iPad so you can watch them directly as opposed to streaming. Exactly, yeah. because uh, I used to be in a remote area, and right. I, did, I couldn't get cellular or Wi-Fi up there or anything, but I'd still enjoy watching videos. So. Well, if you think about it, an iPad's a perfect device for that. It's got lots of storage, gigabytes of storage. It's got a beautiful display. It's portable. Right. It's, a, it's a personal TV. That's what a great use for it. Yes, yes. And that's the question I had. It, um I can't find a way to download and save videos uh, onto my iPad that's a third generation iPad. Yeah, Do because you know the mo well, the trend is uh, towards streaming and towards yeah, rental. Exactly. And I think that really comes from a you know the paranoia about piracy that Hollywood has. Right. Right. Uh, so they figure, well, if he could make a copy of it, he could sell a copy of it. So let's just offer it on Netflix or on right. iTunes as streaming content and not let him save it in any way. So yeah. There are there are ways to do it, of course. The first thing is to get it onto the drive. Uh, do you have a computer? Oh, yeah. I the the a, easiest uh, way to do movie. it is to rip the movie on a computer, somehow get a copy on the computer, and then use iTunes to sync it over. And uh, there are a number of video players. In addition to the, you know, the native QuickTime player that's all on all iPads, there are a number of third-party uh, video players that will also uh, also yeah. work just fine, like VLC and and so right. forth. Um, so well, the that was my frustration, Leo, was that I thought here I've paid six hundred dollars for this iPad third yeah. generation. You know, thirty-two gigabytes has plenty of uh, storage space. And when I'm up in the mountains, I can't get reception, so right. I can't enjoy videos up there. I don't want to go through the hassle of plugging it in with a cord and hooking it up to my Windows 8 machine and then going to iTunes, which I hate anyway. 
I think iTunes is a terrible thing. Oh, it's awful, especially on Windows. Yes. So I found a workaround, and I thought I'd share it with you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I discovered it by accident. I was on Amazon. I was looking for a way to add uh, storage to my 32-gigabyte third-generation iPad. Mm -hmm. It's already running out. And uh, I, I use Avid Studio to make movies and things, so it fills it up rather quick. Well, I got a hold of a product, a line on a product called iFlash. Have you heard of this? I have not. Is this in the uh, regular store or is this in the uh, Sedia? Yeah, or if you, if you go to the Amazon store and type in iFlash Drive. Ah, it's for the Macintosh. I see, yeah. No, no, no. This no? is for the iPad. Oh, it's an iPad. And it's for the third generation iPad. They don't make the one yet for the lightning connector. Ah. And is That's it available is it available uh, on the regular app store? Yes. iFlash. iFlash Drive. And it okay, hang on, because we've got to take a break, but you can tell me how it works when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hmm. Interesting. So it's a piece of hardware. what it is. But we'll find out. If mailing and shipping yeah, keys are an important is part of running your small business, why are you Yeah, so it? it's it's hardware. I get it. <laughs> so it, it has a 30-pin connector. I see. That's why it doesn't work on the Lightning. It's a 30-pin connector. Got it. It's an external flash drive with... No, that's different. different. That's a flash bulb. For any letter or package, right. your I flash drive. Not I flush drive. I flash drive. So never have to go to the ah, it's, it's from Hyperdrive. One of those expensive postage meters. Okay. And you know what? The mail carrier comes to you, picks up the package, delivers it for you. Stamps.com to send out. We love it to send out. I don't know. You got to try it. Change the name. Risk trial, Keep bonus, searching. I flash drive at Amazon. Fifty-five dollars free postage. Go to stamps.com. Click the microphone at the top of the homepage and type. Maybe this is what he's talking about. Look at that about. deal. Stamps.com. Use my name, Leo. Mm. Epson projectors showcase amazing yeah. color brightness for brilliant image quality with today's high definition. I'm thinking it's a it's a hard drive or a USB drive with a 30 pin connector, right? One brightness measurement. Lumens is not enough. You want to look for both high or color is it this? and high white brightness to a true impressive image. <laughs> want to use your iPhone or iPod Touch as a flash drive? Epson projectors. I don't Whether even understand. Playing video games or just watching family <laughs> Check out I'm confused. 30, 20, 50, 20, ultra black, 2D, and 3D projectors. Uh -huh. and wireless. These projectors are still the only way to get truly. Yeah, if you buy it on iTunes, that's probably the easiest thing to do, huh? That's 25 times the size of a 60 inch flat panel. Epson has what you need in Like a USB drive for your iPad or iPhone. AV enthusiast. You'll find the right projector for your home or office needs with three times the color. You can right bet that Apple will not let them make this for the .com to learn lightning more. cable. Epson. Built to perform. This must be it, huh? No. Oh, I get it. It turns the iPhone into a USB drive. And it has its own storage. I'm confused. Well, I should get one of these. Do they still offer it? Yeah, it has a it has eight, sixteen, thirty-two, or sixty-four gigs. I flash drive. So why get I flash drive when you could get USB port? <laughs> I get it. So this turns anything into a Wi-Fi. So you don't need a connection at all. USB hard drive, flash drive, wirelessly makes contents available to iOS, Android, or Wi-Fi enabled. So it just turns this into a... You know, I have uh, the... Um, Seagate makes that thing, the, the to-go thing, whatever. It's a, this, is, this is a cool idea. 
So that's a, it's kind of a similar idea. Yeah. And there are Wi-Fi hard drives, but this would make any hard drive a Wi-Fi hard drive. Interesting. It's a hundred bucks. <sighs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. We're talking about ways to get more content into your iPad or iPhone um, and uh, so that you can watch movies on it and so forth. And um, we were talking to uh, Greg in Hanford, California, uh, about something he found called the iFlash Drive. And I'm, I'm kind of searching around. It's a, it, it's a commonly used name, unfortunately, for a variety of devices. But I gather what you have is a device that plugs into your 30-pin connector and then lets you plug a hard drive into it. Is that right, Greg? Well well, that's uh, that's the gist of it, Leo. I was on Amazon and um, I looked for the i flash. It's i dash capital F L A S H capital D R I V E. It's the dash that uh, that makes it yeah. uh, easier to find. Yeah, HD is the one that okay. I got for the iPad. Now, uh, Amazon now the problem with that is it's limited. It's a physical connection, so. Until they make a lightning adapter, which they don't currently, you're going to have to use it with your old. Right. But you I've have an iPad 3, so that's, yeah, that's fine. So that's not an issue. Yeah. And then they have software uh, that goes on the uh, yes, the it's device. Yes, Apple-approved right. software. Yeah, which and is and nice. That's the, and that's the key. It's got to be Apple-approved. I also, um, uh, now, in my search, found one that uses Wi-Fi that will let any hard drive or flash drive become a Wi-Fi drive you could access from your no. iPhone, but anything else. And that would eliminate the issue with the connector. Of course, it wouldn't be as fast. Right. And and that's from uh, HyperDrive makes something called the iUSB. This so, is from a company called PhotoFast. Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with them, actually. And uh, Okay. Yeah, this is a good anyway, idea. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I, I was going to order one from Amazon, and they're sold out. So... I went ahead and downloaded the software, and the software is really good. I've got the app on my... Well, how do you use it, though, if you don't have the uh, iFlash well, drive? that's where I found the workaround to get my videos uh, onto my iPad. Um, they ha You set up a Dropbox account, uh -huh. and then from my computer, I can, I can drop any kind of video I want into my Dropbox account. Right. And then, and then copy it with this iFlash app to local storage on my ipad yeah dropbox is very handy for that kind of thing yes and it yeah. works great yeah I, uh, downloaded a lot that's of a good YouTube solution videos. if so you have it on your hard drive and then dropbox you don't need any special app now dropbox just has it uh synchronizes it to your ios device well it it stores it in a in a special place well, but now you can, flash, in many cases, you can play that video. If it's QuickTime compatible video, you can play it back right from the Dropbox. So, right. Yeah. But uh, remember I was mentioning I'm frequently in an area that doesn't have any Wi-Fi or cellular. Right. So you'd have to do the synchronization so, before yeah, you leave. If I'm camping or something like that, right. I can take my iPad and have, uh, right. you know, videos to watch and things like right. that. So, yeah, I love anyway, it. I think that's, that's, a, that's a great use of it. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. And you've also pointed me towards a number of interesting... Alternative choices uh, using uh, Wi-Fi and so forth. Uh, this ninety-nine dollars for this uh, iUSB from HyperDrive is an interesting. That's an interesting product. It's a little pricey. Uh, Hypershop.com. If you want to uh, find out more about that, they call it the iUSB port, and it essentially is a Wi-Fi USB port. So it's connected via Wi-Fi to anything that supports Wi-Fi, and then you uh, connect a hard drive up to it. Um, and this would work in the mountains because I think I'll have to get one and find out, but generally the way these work is they become a Wi-Fi access point. So you don't need to have internet access or Wi-Fi. You just, this thing, you just use your iPad, your iPhone or whatever to connect to the device. It's its own access point, its own, uh, its own Wi-Fi access point. You connect to it. You don't get internet access, but you get access to the files on it. Copy the files over if you want or play it back directly. You just need the power. That's an interesting product as well. 
So there you go. A couple of ways. To, and apparently Apple doesn't mind. Hallie in Los Angeles, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Hallie. Hi, Leo. Um, thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. I have an issue with uh, the Windows Live Amazon. I have an Amazon uh, account. Right, right, right. right. So I'm paying. Uh, uh, the thing is, some like weeks ago, probably like a, a month and a half, uh, something happened. You know, this is how my technical knowledge is. Stuff happens to me online. <laughs> I know. We're all at the. We all feel like victims in technology, right? I don't know what's going on. It just happened. So uh, I was victimized by Outlook. They sort of put, put yeah. in Outlook there. And, live, uh, Microsoft is killing Live, or if, if they haven't already killed Live, it's now Outlook.com. Oh, okay. Anyway, so, but the bottom line is this. Uh, my problem is I can't download documents. I use this for work, uh, and, and I uh, get all kinds of documents, uh, Word and, and PDFs online. I can't download them from the email account. How interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when so I'm, I'm looking in my Outlook account, because, of course, what, what Microsoft has done is they deprecated the idea of live. They want everybody to move to Outlook.com. If you go to Live.com for your live mail, you'll get Outlook. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, their, that's what they think of as the future. Um, and actually, I think the Outlook mail is quite good. But you're saying attachments don't show up. And I'm trying to look. Here's an attachment. Let me just uh, see if I can. I managed to get out of the Outlook and keep my Windows Live thingy, which, you know, I don't. Oh, that might have been a mistake. <laughs> so somebody has sent me a picture of a dog. And uh, he's, he, uh, it, I, I open it in, uh, in Outlook, and I see, not only do I see the image, but I see a button at the bottom of the image that says download. It's, uh, I get an attachment here. I'm looking at a PDF file. Yeah. Uh, it says, you know, uh, it's a PO from somebody, and, and there's a download, and I hit download. But what happens? Nothing. Well, it seems to be working, and uh, now I'm hitting it, and it seems to be working, and uh, then just nothing happens. <laughs> now I'm puzzled, because I just downloaded this image of a dog, and it downloaded, and it's opened, and it's there. So, um, I'm, is it only with this particular attachment, or is this happening with all attachments? All attachments, and there are there are uh, options here. Download a zip. Okay, here I have something coming up. Yeah. Yeah, this actually happens. Uh, in, uh, Windows Internet Explorer it says, "What do you want to do with it? Get attachment a ASPX file and." That's just a web page. That's not going to give okay. you any content. So now I'm hitting here, open. Yeah. Well, let's let's hit save because that's what I need. Right. Uh, nope. I wonder if it's blocking attachments for some reason uh, for a security. This is all in the w in the web-based version of Outlook. Yes. This is not in the Outlook. This is in the Windows Live Hotmail. But yeah. I have an MSN account, which is not a Hotmail account, which is a a paid. I think your security settings are probably blocking uh, attachments. If you go into settings, you'll see. Um, uh, some information on attachments. It's interesting because what the, this is, I think this is a part of Microsoft's move away from MSN and away from Live to Outlook and SkyDrive. What they want is yeah. SkyDrive to store that attachment and for you to access it from SkyDrive. Okay. Yeah. Saving the ASPX file is not going to do anything. That's a web page. You want to save the PDF file. Yeah. My strong suggestion, did they not say move to Outlook? That would be my strong suggestion. That's where they want you to be. They don't want you using Hotmail anymore anyway. Um, and I think Outlook's better. So I think if you move to Outlook, you'll be happier. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, the echo was bad on that one. I don't know why some, act, some some phone callers echo and some don't. I'm not going to say anything more about it. It only caused heartbreak. Did uh, Peter leave or is he coming back? Oh, he just went to get something to eat. All right. Ooh, uh, yeah. You got an hour between shows. Sound note for iPad. Oh, I have to open up. Let me try. I downloaded this. Uh, storage. Notepad app. Did it, did it install? Maybe it, no, maybe it installed on a tablet. I don't installed. I think it did install on something else. My Nexus 7. I'll have to play with it with Nexus 7. 
You like, uh, okay, Andy Paper's hard to use tutorial does not work. Emailed a note. And it's an attachment with app mode. You have to open it in another Andy Paper app. Well, that would suck, Dale Paper. Dvorak, Jason Heiner, Natalie Morris today on Twitter. Thank you, Kevin and Dublin. You have discovered how to make your voices echo. How do you do it, Marvet? What we're doing is we're moving the call screening apparatus here from Sherman Oaks. The theory being if we do it up here, we won't have an echo. At great expense, I might add. And we'll have to hire a call screener up here. But at least if the uh, VPN goes down, they can come running in and say, Hey, Leo, you know what I think I'll do? I'll hire an attractive young lady, and she could sit right here. Seriously. Seriously. Gina Salvati. Gina, come on up. You sit right next to me, and I'll go, Hey, Gina, who's our next caller? We used to do this on Call for Help. It was great. And she said, Yeah. And you she'd say, Well, Leo, we've got Kathy in, in Huntington Beach having problems with her smartphone. I'll say, Hey, Kathy. And then you get another another person in here. Don't you think that'll work well? Yeah. We'd have to put you in a soundproof booth up here. Ramirez would fly me up every weekend. It would be perfect. We'll fly you up every week. <laughs> well, Premier might do it, actually, because they have to hire somebody. Yeah. I'd do it, Leo. All right. Gina Vassalvati volunteers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't be without Kyle. <sighs> See, that's the problem is the board ops has to stay in Sherman Oaks. Well, at least I can be surrounded with great people. <laughs> it's like a it's like a tomb down there, isn't it? There's nobody there. Nobody but an <laughs> HR trail. Oh dear. Somebody I guess we could... No, somebody really has to be there, I think. Could we? Maybe we could connect direct and then knock from here. Actually, I could just buy Premier. <laughs> That's a good idea. We just buy Premier. Pardon me? It doesn't solve the problem, no. I just got a list from Premiere of all the shows they do. They don't, do you not do Rush Limbaugh anymore? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Alan is in West Los Angeles. Hi, Alan. Leo Laporte here. Hello there, Leo. How are you? I am well. How are you? Okay, I just realized that one of your colleagues over at Tech TV was Michaela Pereira. Uh, she's now at KTLA, that's right. Which we get to watch every morning, so I just wanted to oh, mention that. I miss working with Michaela. She was just so wonderful. Uh, she was a great friend and um, a really talented host, And but she, she landed uh, on both feet. KTLA has been a great gig for her for, what, almost 10 years now. Yeah, not yeah. a bad deal. Not yeah, a bad deal good trade. So here's my question. Um, I'm finding that we're having trouble getting Wi-Fi in one room of the house, and so I have been introduced to the idea of a Wi-Fi repeater. One of my tech friends says that, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem, no, no big deal. You just plug it in the wall, and then it'll send the signal over to that other room. Another friend of mine says, I've never found a repeater that I like, and so I've given up on them completely. Uh, you want to tell me who's telling the truth? Yeah, well, I'll tell you the rules about repeaters. It's using a technology called WDS, Wireless Distribution System, and the, and the spec for it is fairly loose. So different companies implement it with slight differences, which is probably the reason Friend 1 had or Friend 2 had trouble with it. Um, you really want to get a repeater from the same company that makes your router. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Because okay. Uh, you want to match chipsets and match firmware. Got it. Okay, so that means it would not be a good idea. So who, who, do you, who makes your router? Uh, I think it's, I just got it from a new one. I think it's from Belkin. Okay. So Belkin will make a repeater. And Belkin's a little bit of a different story because they buy 
uh, these things from other companies and rebrand, relabel them. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can uh, get a, a Belkin repeater, and it probably will work, the best thing to do is to find out what the chipset is in your original router. Is it an Atheros um, or what, you know whatever brand it is, and match that if you can. Um, and then what happens is uh, it's pretty straightforward. The repeater doesn't do any work. It just pass, you know, pa boosts and passes the signal along. It becomes what we call a bridge. Right. And so uh, I, I use an Airport Extreme from Apple and an Airport Express, and it works great. It's very simple to set up WDS. And, but my experience has been as long as these things uh, are made from the same manufacturer, they generally work well together. Okay. And I don't have to plug the device into the repeater, is that correct? Because it's essentially just amplifying the signal. Yeah, that it's a, it's, it, it stands midway between you and the distant wired room, unwired room, and it boosts the signal. So you'll, you'll plug it into the wall, and it will receive the signal from your base station and pass it along. So even though I see these deals at Amazon for 30 bucks up to Best Buy over $100, is better to try to find something that would be... You want it to match. You want yeah. it to match. If, if, failing that, if it doesn't work well for you, the other choice would be power line networking, which often works well, uh, uses your grid, your power, your internal power wiring. Oh, I remember you talking about that. Yeah, in the newer, in the early days, it was terrible. It's gotten better and better, and it's not bad now. Okay. Another way to do it. And then in that case, you could just use power line networking to get to that room and then hardwire it. Much appreciated as always, sir. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate your listening. 8888 Ask Leo's the number. Kathy Huntington Beach, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. I'm sorry. I'm driving. I was going to pull over. I thought your screener would come back on, so I'm going to pull over here. Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't want to get you in trouble. That's fine, Kathy. Take your time. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'm, I'm good. I'm off the freeway, okay, so good. Yeah. I appreciate you taking my call. Um, my problem is off, my phone dropped me three times while I was waiting to talk oh, to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I am uh, desperate to get a new phone. I have a very old flip phone that hangs up on people when I don't hold it open. The spring's broken. <laughs> I can't text. I can't it's, do anything with it's, this stupid it's thing. It's time for a new phone. I think you earned yeah. it. Yeah, I've, uh, In I'm fact, I bet your wireless carrier has been begging you to get a new phone. They have been, and actually they are going away. But I'm not real thrilled with them either, which is why I think that's why I've been dropped three times. It could be. You know, AT&T and the iPhone were a nasty combination for a while. I just knew when I was talking to somebody on an iPhone, the, the call would die sometime in the next few minutes. Because it just it would. Yep. it's gotten better, but that was a real problem for a while. Yep. So, so you want a new carrier? Who's your current carrier? Um, currently, I'm on Sprint, Nextel, and Nextel is going away. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, do you use that push yeah. to talk feature? Um, I did with my husband, and that's why I got it a gazillion years ago, but now he no longer has that. Yeah, because they're phasing it out. They want to kill that network, the IDEN network that they've been using. And they, yeah. they claim to offer push to talk phones that use the current network, but I don't know how well those work. And Sprint, and frankly, not, is struggling. I, Sprint's network. I'm not into that anymore anyway. Yeah. He doesn't on his new phone through his company, so I'm not going to go that way either. So It seemed like a good idea at the time, but it's kind of annoying. Yeah, and when it's in my purse, it gets bumped and it beeps. Beep, beep. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of annoying. So um, uh, we've moved on. I would say uh, in your area, Verizon is probably the best carrier. Okay. They have... About Verizon had trouble with them before. Crossing them uh, off, okay. <laughs> that leaves us AT and T. <laughs> yeah. AT and T's um, fine too. I don't think anything. You know, AT and T really suffered by being the only company with an iPhone for a long time, and I think that the iPhone users use so much data that they really bogged the AT and T network down. But I think they've caught up. I think their network is better now, and I it is in fact many say faster than Verizon, and I've had that experience. It, it seems to be quite fast. Depends a lot on well, your location. I use my phone a lot, but um, so I want something reasonably priced too for a for a carrier. So I was looking at Virgin and T-Mobile. Okay, um, let me tell you this about Virgin. If you hate Sprint, you won't like Virgin because it's on the Sprint network. Okay, we'll get rid of that one. Crossing that one off. I have a lot of X's on my clipboard right now. Um, and uh, <laughs> T-Mobile, you know, I I feel for T-Mobile. They're the also ran. And, uh, and they've struggled a little bit, but they were purchased recently by SoftBank, a big Japanese company, which, which is putting a lot of money into it. It could be that T-Mobile will come back and be really good. The real problem with T-Mobile um, is uh, coverage. 
at this point. Um, but if it works well in Huntington Beach, if it works well where you go, then it's as good as anybody else, and it's certainly a lot cheaper than anybody else. Well, one of the nice things, I did check with them, and they said that if I purchased whatever phone I purchased, and I'm on a month-to-month, if in the first 30 days I'm not getting the coverage I want um, in the areas I'm going, that they would take the phone back, and then I'd, I'm not locked into a contract. I like that, too. And I think almost yeah. everybody will at least give you a few weeks to try it and see if it works well okay. for you. I mean, but that's... Sign up for something and then have the problem I was having while I was driving to keep being dropped. And but as far as phones go, how about this, Sam? Somebody. Just By the way, I apologize. SoftBank bought Sprint, not T-Mobile, so Sprint's going to get better. <laughs> T-Mobile may oh, okay. not. I have my mistake. T-Mobile may not get better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like T-Mobile. They're owned by NT uh, by uh, uh, the German Deutsche Telekom, and I I really like T-Mobile. I want them to do well. Uh, because we need the competition, right? So, um, well, it's but it's it's tough for them because they've got three monster companies uh, ahead of them. Yeah, I agree with you on Sprint. I'm disappointed I don't by mean the to network. Cut you off, but my phone keeps going out. I think you've stopped talking. So I'm sorry. I'm not being rude talking over you. Oh no, that's okay. I apologize for talking over you. So let's go with T-Mobile. Let's go with. I think you. I think you know T-Mobile's a fine choice. Are you thinking about what kind of phone now? You can't get an iPhone on T-Mobile. Um, right, and someone said Samsung Galaxy. My my strong choice is the Galaxy S3. Okay. Very nice phone, or the Galaxy I use, which might be too big for you, which is a Galaxy Note. Yeah, someone mentioned that as well, because I would like to have a little bit bigger screen since I'm stuck places waiting a lot and I like to play around I, or would like to play around. I've been watching I it. love it, but I want you to go to the store and play with it because it's giant. It's five and a half inches. Personally, for me, this is the perfect phone. I am a huge Note 2 fan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, T-Mobile's moving to a uh, non-contract uh, plan, too. Well, they say you'll be able to get it. We'll see. Can't get it right now. They have the Nexus Four. The for internet 50 is bucks. an absolute necessity for our everyday life. But we all know there's a that's lot a, of that's that's also stuff a good choice. Web. How do I get online? You you like to know? Or you have an S three? Yeah. You know, here play with it. I I, I think that the um, S three is pretty big. I mean, it's a it's a good size phone. I was having trouble with my Wi Fi on the S three. It seemed to have a, a yeah, I love the Note. It's the same resolution as that S3, so it isn't like you're getting more real estate, just more uh, screens, you know, bigger, bigger screen. They have the HTC One as well. They have a lot of good choices on T-Mobile. Uh, some of the best Android phones on T-Mobile. It is faster. That's a that's a quad core. The uh, the S3 in the U.S. is dual core. Um, you know, I think the S3 is... Oh, you gave up the S3, Dr. Mama? You went back to the... I mean, the Note 2, you went back to the S3? I think the S3 is... is you know, they're really the same phone. It's just a different screen, uh, more screen real estate. They're very similar to the S3. So... And that means having the right tools, especially... Yeah, she should get a new phone. Give her the S3 and get a Note. Yeah, I, I love the Note. I feel like the Note um, is a great... You know, tablet almost. You know, it's it's such a big phone. Um, when I play Simpsons Tapped Out, I really feel like I'm there in Springfield. That's I measure every phone now by the ability to play the Simpsons Tapped Out. Well, that's right. You got the red S3. I forgot that, Doctor Mom. Yeah. The S4 will be one to look at as well. That's supposed to be announced in March, and then uh, probably come out a month or two after that. That's the problem is you got to wait, right? The Android version of this game leaves something to be desired. For one thing, it seems like no matter what the volume is set on the phone, it's extra loud. So no matter where I am in meetings or whatever, I have Homer Simpson shouting at me. Hey, come here, play with me. And that's a little annoying. Although it can lighten, liven up a meeting, business meeting. Ha, ha. Get me some of that city food. I like m that meat they got without the head and fur. <laughs> so he's going to go, oh, I have to build a dumpster for him. 
All right, well, we got to build him a dumpster. Put it out behind the uh, quickie mart. He's going to play with his MyPad. He's going to go shopping. <laughs> and then... Have a dumpster. Make him dig through the dumpster. There you go. I love that slap your mama. I put it on everything. I don't have a Maple store on this one. This one is my second Springfield. The big, the big Springfield's on the iOS because it, uh, it's, it's been around the longest. And I'm, I refuse to buy donuts on my new Springfield, so it's not doesn't have anything interesting going on. I don't think the Maple is the Maple. I guess you can buy the Maple store with donuts. <clears throat> I got it back when it was a, not a premium item, but just something. But you know, it's funny. It does not crash. The network does not crash on Android, but it crashes on this all the time. T-Mobile Sonic 2.0. It's going to have LTE. <clears throat> All right, Leo, Carbonite's your last live read. What? Carbonite, last live read. <laughs> Strangest meme ever. It seems like just somebody just made it up. That was mine. That was the one where I broke the table. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This show brought to you by Carbonite. Uh, we were talking about team choosing a carrier, and uh, I, di I didn't want to keep her on hold. See, her phone kept dropping out, but I talk a little bit more about that. She's on Sprint, wasn't happy with the service. She didn't like Verizon from a previous experience. Virgin Mobile's based on the Sprint network, so I'd had to rule that one off. She says uh, AT and T. She for some reason didn't want either, <laughs> so she's looking at T Mobile, and I'm rooting for T Mobile. They're the also ran right now. They're the little guy. Now that Sprint's been purchased by a big Japanese company and with lots of money and, and coming in and so forth, it looks like Sprint might uh, be coming back. So T-Mobile is still struggling. Remember, they tried to merge with AT&T. U.S. regulators prohibited that. But they've, uh, I think T-Mobile, to their credit, is trying to find a way. Uh, they've decided to do away with contracts. They're going to go month to month with everybody, and they're going to uh, stop subsidizing phones so much. They're, in, they're implementing LTE, but right now they don't have LTE. They're the only major carrier not to have LTE data. But they have a great variety of phones from a very aggressively priced. The Nexus 4, which is a Google phone and is a, you know very popular with the, this, the hardcore Android crowd. That's only 49 bucks. They have waived activation fees. They're really getting aggressive. Uh, they do have the Galaxy Note 2. I would look at that as well as the Galaxy S3. They have uh, the Lumia, uh, which is a great Windows phone, quite a good phone. Uh, they don't have the iPhone yet, although rumors are they'll have the iPhone sometime later this year. I think, frankly, they've got phones that are just as good. I, don't, I wouldn't wait for an iPhone. They also have the HTC One, which is a very nice uh, phone. I got to say, I think that uh, given that if you're signing up for a two-year uh, deal right now, for you can get a Galaxy S2 free. That is a great deal. But I would want you to go into the store and try it because this is a huge phone. The S2, the Galaxy uh, Note, I should say, too, not the S2. The Galaxy Note is a five and a half inches. So I guess it was the S2 that was free. The S3 is a little more expensive, and I bet the Note is as well. The Note is 5.5 inches. The uh, S3 is only 4.8 inches. Both are big, but both have beautiful screens. They're very legible. I think are are good choices. And I, frankly, I like the T-Mobile network. I, uh, I, I'm not, I don't think they're a bad network at all. And since they, they, there's not a lot of congestion, since there aren't so many customers, it might even perform better where you are. Paul's in Redondo Beach, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Paul. Hey, Leo. How you doing? Thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it very Thank much. Thank you. My pleasure. Big fan, big fan of your show. Thanks. 
Um, I'm not very computer savvy, but I was actually asked to fix my sister's uh, Dell Inspirion three-year-old laptop. You're more savvy than she is, obviously. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, problem she was having probably for about six months is the registry errors keep kept coming up on our C drive. Oh, dear. So I spoke with my cable company, and they said basically it's an operating system issue that we don't deal with that. That's right. It, it, registry errors are, are pure Windows problems. Right. So she did have the original disk you know, that she had Good. purchased. With the laptop, so that's great. Apparently, I think I may have messed up, so I'll take maybe take blame for that. When you in reinstall a disk, uh, you know, your operating system, does it ask you where to save it to? Depends. Was it a system recovery disk or a true Windows install disk? Did it have the Microsoft? True Windows install. So it had the Microsoft logo and a hologram and all of that. Yeah, yep. but the problem is she on um, she has also on that laptop a. E drive, which is a system restore drive or, right. or a backup drive or something. Right. That's kind of what you want to work from, frankly. Well, it got saved to there. So now we have two operating systems. One that yeah. is, I want to say, corrupt on the C drive. Yeah. So and you want to, continue. at this point, it's time to start over. Okay. So how do I do that? How do I, because basically I'm looking at a, a, a C drive that is kind of corrupt. It's yeah. It's the whole thing is a mess, really. Uh, what you want to do is back up any data because you're going to, we're going to wipe the whole drive at this point. Okay. Uh, back, and you're right. It should have asked you. It should have said, "Hey, I see Windows here." Yeah, because there's not enough space on this E drive. So basically, yeah, no, it shouldn't have done what it did. Uh, it should have said, "Hey, I see Windows is already on here. Where do you want me to install?" Mm -hmm. But at this point, I would start from scratch, which okay. means you're going to erase the entire drive. How do I do that? Uh, it's in Windows. It's in, mm -hmm. but make sure again. You're gonna, by erasing it, you're erasing everything. So make sure she's got everything backed up. This is actually the best thing to do anyway. Uh, and you're right. going you're going to uh, run the Windows installer. And at, at, there, watch carefully. Don't just go, okay, okay, okay. At right. one point, you'll have a chance to repartition the drive. That's what you want to do. I want to repartition. Yeah, you're going to go into the partitioner, and you're going to delete all existing partitions. You're going to have one C drive. And you're going to format that NTFS, and you're going to install Windows on it, and you'll be done. And it'll give you, you that... Mean? What do you mean by that format at one? Is there something I have to do for that? Like type Yeah, well, once you get to the partitioner, uh, you will see that it's got a C, D, and E drive. Okay. And um, what you do, just delete them all. Okay. How do I get to that partitioner? What is that on? on I can't, on you know, it's in, it's in an option, it's in an option menu. Okay. Again, this is, this is, you're going to, this is, works best from a Windows installer. It says Microsoft's got a holographic label on it, all of that. You're lucky you got that. That actually is the best thing to have. It, what oh, version of Windows is this? That I'll see that when I insert the disk. Yeah, right, not right away. Yeah, you'll f you'll first run through the installer, but at one point there'll be options. Okay. So you just watch very, read the screens very carefully as you go. I think it might be custom install. Custom install, okay. And uh, you want to go in and look at the drive, and you until you actually can see the drive and see C, D, and E, then you haven't done it yet. So don't don't install until you get to that point. Okay. And then you're going to delete the partitions, existing partitions. That e, e partition's been overwritten, unfortunately. That was probably the best way to restore the drive. Yeah, the only problem is there was only 20 gigs on it. So yeah, it it's the it, what it is is an, it's a restore partition that the manufacturer puts on there with all the proper drivers and everything. And it'd be nice oh, to. So have, I just had to go there it, and not the disk. Yeah. Ah, uh, did not know that. That's all right. It's done now, and it, you know what? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, and, you know, you're better off with a virgin Windows disk. The only difference is you're going to have to download drivers from the manufacturer. I have the, that disk as well. Good. And then you're going to have to make sure you run Windows Update like a crazy man until every... Yeah, it was 100 and something. More yeah, you want to keep updating it till no more update, no more critical updates are available. But then you have a completely up-to-date system. It's fresh. It's, she's got maximum disk space, which is nice because we got rid of some of those extra drives. And uh, and it'll run much faster now. She restores her data and puts her apps on, and she's good to go. The and key then is it won't ask me at startup anymore, even before the desktop. Choose which disk to use. Type of it shouldn't ask you anything. Okay. All and right. you should no longer see those registry errors now. If the registry errors were happening because her hard drive was flaky, this might be enough to refresh it, but it might not be. If okay. it starts happening again, you need a new hard drive. No, I, I would say not because on the new on the new one that I installed on the E drive, there was no issue. No whatsoever. problem. Yeah, that's so it got it corrupted. No yeah. big deal. 
Okay, so just to recap real quick, because I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little illiterate on this, I'm going to see this uh, this on a custom install from the disk itself, from the actual install. Disk. Yeah, custom okay. install, and you want to delete partitions. Let me see if I could find a great place for instructions. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, on the web, you got a recommendation I don't wanna, chat I don't room. Mess up her, her, uh, laptop anymore than I yeah, do. I mean, you, if you look for a clean install, when what version is it? You say Windows Seven? She has Windows Vista Home Premium, a thirty-two. Vista, okay. System. So uh, if you look for clean install of Vista, this old geek probably has something like that. That's a great site for uh, people who want to uh, do things like this. Okay. Um, this old geek dot com, I think, is the uh, is that the name of it? No, that's not it. <laughs> that's my welcome to my little corner of Costa Rica. That's not it. <laughs> Was it the Elder Geek? That's it. The Elder Geek. Let me let me try that one. Maybe that's it. No, that's not it either. Well, I'm sure I'll. <laughs> I'll keep listening. <laughs> well, the show's almost almost over. Yeah, theeldergeek.com. That's it. Great place for just this kind of basic stuff. And they have a Windows Vista uh, section, and uh, it has lots of information. And and I think even stuff on clean install, how to do it, all that stuff. Carbon. So you're saying it could be repaired? It could be. Repaired. Oh yeah, absolutely. You haven't lost anything. You're in good shape, actually. Uh, you're gonna have a nice, clean, lean. Machine. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the tech guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the tech guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows and Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today and our weekly roundtable show This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.